The chair notes that the chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the ZBA, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members and panel for this meeting. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Dylan Maxfield. Present. Ms. Sarah Marshall. Present. Ms. David, Mr. David Sloviter. Oh, you're muted. Present. Present. There you go. And Mr. Vince O'Connor. Present. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Ms. Christine Brestrup, the planning director, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, planner for the town. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to, wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. They may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube webpage and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. If on the phone, they should ask for assistance from, uh, we'll make, we'll uh, announce how to, how members of the public wishing to comment by phone can access this meeting. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition is each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits. And the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an ag aggrieved party to contest the, the decision with the relevant judicial body and superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing on ZBA 2023-14, the Spoke LLC. Request for a special permit under section 3.352.2 of the zoning bylaw to change the use of the building located at 1 to 11 Prey Street, AKA 15 to 33 Prey Street, Amherst, Massachusetts, 01002, from a three space commercial building consisting of a bar, general cleaners, and a laundromat, to a single space commercial building consisting of a nightclub, and request for a special permit under section 5.042 of the zoning bylaw for live or pre-recorded entertainment. Map 11C, parcel 70, 274, Business General Zoning District. This is continued from April 13th, 2023. There's a, following the public hearing, we will move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. There'll be general comment period and other business not anticipated within 48 hours. We are gonna do something that we haven't done previously we're going to consider the meeting, the uh, last week's minutes 
and adopt those, uh, consider them, amend them, or adopt those as is the, the, the determination of the board. Uh, Rob, thank you very much for doing the meeting minutes. Um, that's a nice change. And I think that that really helps us uh, and help me um, uh, in ter terms of trying to make sure that we had everything for tonight's uh, meeting all um, uh, in line. So um, I know there was one change that Mr. O'Connor wished to make for the the um, minutes, and that was to correct who your la the owner of the property in which you live is, and that's Jones' property and not not the applicant. Is that correct? That's correct. And the the wording of the proposed uh, change in the minutes um, uh, was is be, should be before you in a in a memo from Chris Prestrup. Yep. And I did, I did file a notice um, uh, with regard to this matter with the town clerk prior to the, to the meeting of April, um, but evidently the wording didn't get to you in time. Okay, got it. So those, we'll make those two changes, those without objection, those two changes will be made. Ms. Marshall. I don't object to them, but I also yeah. have some questions or clarifications to. Make. All right. Yep. Hold on. Let me get the let me get those meetings, uh, the minutes in front of me, and we can we can do that. All right. What's the first correction so, or question you have? Page two on the third bullet. Does the abutting bank have an agreement to let the Spoke Live use their parking spots? Mr. O'Rourke stated they do not and that parking is not a concern of theirs. That just, the last phrase sounds dismissive. So we could alter it just to say that they're not required to provide parking or that their customers don't, their patrons don't drive. They tend not to drive. So, I mean, but yep. just to say it's not a concern seems um, dismissive. Um, yep. then, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I, I think that's a good change. Um, all right. Yes, if anyone objects, they should speak up Say before so I now. Yep. the next one. <laughs> yep. All right. The second set of bullets, the first one, says most of the intended improvements to the building would be for soundproofing purposes. I'm not sure that's totally accurate. They're putting in a whole slew of bathrooms and making a lot of big improvements. Maybe just add most of the intended improvements to the building envelope would be for soundproofing. Yeah, where's that again? The, the, first, the first bullet on the same page, but in the second set of bullets. Oh yeah, got it. Yeah, the building. Or we could just say, you know, what we could say is, is um, Improvements to the build, building include soundproofing. Right. Or or some, so, yeah, we can just yeah, just something yeah. like that. Yeah, we don't have to characterize most or not. We can just right. say that that's the, what what they intend. So we'll just, why don't we do that, Ms. Marshall? Just say that. Um, that's fine. Improvements to the building include soundproofing. Okay, I assume Rob is writing all this down. So. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, the third page, then the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet. Just a typo. It said employees will have the appropriate certifications inside the parentheses. Oh. I think it should be crowd control. Not yep. crown. Crowd manager is the uh, is the appropriate. Crown crowd, crowd crowd manager, yeah, I believe, crowd. is the appropriate one. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that that's that same typo is in a couple of places in the uh, project other places i think in the project application report so um Certainly. you might see that again yeah yeah um towards the bottom of that page almost third one from the bottom at least as it prints out for me it says the applicant discussed the sound mitigation that one yep it says one half inch tempered glass windows i believe they're double glazed right so i i don't know if we need to provide so much detail but I think they're double glazed with a layer, some polymer between them, something like that. Does um, anybody have a, I guess I would, 
Normally we wouldn't turn to the applicant at this point, but he's the one that knows the answer to that. So, uh, yeah. It's, are you talking about the windows? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Are they double glazed with the polymer yeah. between? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's All right. Point. Laminated. Yeah. Laminated glass. Correct. Laminated. That's, yeah. Yeah. Maybe okay. better. Yeah, it's not a laminated yeah. barrier or something. Okay, yeah. that's all. That's all. Yeah, it's a two panel that creates a soundproofing in between them. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. 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 All right. Are there any other suggestions for the or recommendations, amendments to the minutes? If not, um, I'd, I'd take a motion. I'd look for a motion that we approve the minutes as amended. Um, do I have a motion? I'll move. Is there a second? A second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> if there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes. The chair votes aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Ms. Sloviter? Mr. Sloviter? Uh, <laughs> Sorry about aye. that. Aye. And, <laughs> and Mr. O'Connor. Yes. All right. Motion carries. So the um, minutes are approved from our meeting on the 13th. Um, Mr. Chairman. On the, yep. Yes. I do Mr. have one O'Connor. declaration. Okay. Um, I was uh, two or three weeks ago, I was at the Kendrick Park across from the spoke. A gentleman who was present on behalf of the applicant. Um, at the site visit, um, uh, approached me, um, uh, said hello. I did not recognize him. He had to introduce himself. He asked why I was there, and I explained that I was there with a, a neighbor's family. Um, and uh, he and he then said, "Well, you know, um, he he basically." Uh, said goodbye and walked back across the street. So there was no discussion of the of the project and the my brief interaction with him will have no impact on my ability to be fair and impartial with regard to the project. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair? Uh, yes, Mr. Maxfield. Uh, that was not a member of the spoke who had done that. That was me who had crossed the street and uh, said hello to Mr. O'Connor. Um, I, I know me and Mr. O'Connor don't see each other too much in person. So, uh, yeah, just for clarification, that was not a representative of the spoke. That was my myself saying hello. Okay. Well, it was um, very out of context, and I, I actually didn't recognize the person and didn't really. <laughs> no worries. And, uh, and and from your, both of your um, representations, you did not discuss or deliberate about the matter. So uh, we have no open meeting violation uh, as far as I'm concerned. So we look to be in good shape. Thank you both for that clarification. Uh, and then Thank Mr. You. Chair, I also have a uh, disclosure as well. Um, since the our last meeting uh, on the Board of Licenses, uh, we recently approved the manager for Spoke Live, and Mr. Colin Hughes will be the manager. Uh, he was a roommate of mine back in 2017. Uh, I know him personally, I, but uh, we don't have any financial relationship uh, at this point. And uh, again, I do not feel that will impact my ability to remain impartial. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Maxfield. Uh, Ms. Brestrup, does does Mr. Maxfield have to file something with the, the town for that? Typically not, I don't think, but I don't clarify think it for so. me. Since he is, um, there's no financial connection, yeah. no, no appearance of a, a conflict of interest in my opinion. Yep, I wouldn't think so either. Okay. And I don't All right. That day, that same day we did, uh, at the same time we, um, Rich Leupold, um, is the new um, license manager of the existing spoke building and Colin would be the proposed manager of the for the liquor license of the new building is what to just to add on to that what what Dylan was bringing up there uh, for the liquor for the liquor board liquor license. All right, uh, Miss, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, Mr. O'Connor. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, the 
the declaration has already been made that the gentleman is a member of the licensing board that was done at the previous meeting so any mm -hmm. issue related to that i think is was resolved at the previous meeting i think too yep i think that's i think you're right so i think it's all good i think we're we're in good shape here okay um what i want to do now is to go through submissions uh, since there are no more for the disclosures minutes are approved from the last meeting i would like to go through submissions for this um First order of business, the first order of business being, we do it again, ZBA 2023-14, the Spoke LLC request for a special permit under section 3.352.2 of the zoning bylaw to change the use of the building located at 1 to 11 Prey Street, AKA 15 to 33 Prey Street, Amherst, Massachusetts 01002 from a three space commercial building consisting of a bar, general cleaners and laundromat to a single space commercial building consisting of a nightclub and request for a special permit under section 5.042 of the zoning bylaw for live or pre recorded entertainment. Map 11C, parcel 274, BG, General Business Zoning District. This is continued from April 13th, 2023. So, so we've had our disclosures. Let's go through submissions. We had several submissions since our last meeting. Many of them were per the request that we had from the applicant. I'm going to go through these um, and uh, Ms. Brestrup and Mr. Wachilla, if I miss one, please, or anybody, but um, especially the staff, if I miss one um, a submission, please let me know. Um, we discussed the changes to the the meeting minutes, which was submitted. Was a, submitted. We had um, a requirements needed for 511, which was submit, which was created by um, the staff, and that included in that is the. Uh, amended version, which has um, submissions from the applicant. We have management review plan, which is the uh, amended management plan from the um, the applicant. I'll make sure you still hear me after it dropped out. Okay, um, which contains um, changes from which was which was submitted earlier. We have a, a rideshare pickup, a map that shows where the rideshare pickup area would be submitted from the applicant. We have um, pursuant to a request from Mr. O'Connor, um, a, uh, I guess, a, a, a log of a um, pan, of the Panda East uh, restaurant in 2015, where there was some um, Miners served alcohol and the consideration from the town select board at the time on how to um, dispose of that allegation in the police report. And um, we also had some information regarding ventilation systems, which was put together by Rob of the staff, as well as occupancy. We, we had asked about occupancy at other um, sites in town. We have an occupancy um, listing for the um, the Drake, as well as the Commonwealth, uh, the uh, certificate of occupancy. And we have uh, photos, live photos of the parking lot across the street from the, the site um, at hours when the site might be in use. Those are the submissions that I have. There are also um, staff submissions, which include, again, the um, the research done for five pursuant from the staff um, researching our questions that the board had for 511. This includes ventilation, sound decibels, police reports, and the PV, PVTA schedule, as well as ride share information for East Pleasant Street. So we have, and the maximum occupancy for Amherst Cinema, Bistro, Monkey, Bistro 63, Monkey Bar, Panda East, Johnny's Tavern, The Spoke, um, and the maximum occupancy for former businesses, the Old Town Tavern at 97 and Charlie's at 99. We included the schedules for the buses, uh, public transportation, and an, also the uh, uh, ride share estimate for number of rides in 2020 or i guess not an estimate but the number of rides in 2022 as well as the rides in 2019. um is there anything that i've forgotten i think that's pretty much 
runs down all the submissions at this time. Oh, we have a, an amended project application report, most importantly. That's, that's the one thing we have to have notice on. All right. Anything else, either Ms. Brestrup or Mr. Wachilla? Yes, Ms. Brestrup. I think there was an email um, from me to Rob Wachilla that I think Rob might have sent out to you that had to do with um, noise levels. Isn't oh, that yes. Yep, yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. And those were questions um, that were brought to our attention by Mr. O'Connor. Yep, noise levels. Exactly. Thank you for that. All right. I think that does the submissions. So what I, I think would probably be most helpful for us would be to go through the response from the applicant on uh, questions that we had uh, at our last meeting. And so I know that you, um, you responded to many of those and you also have amended your management um, plan. And I think what would be best is if we could run through those and um, respond to the questions that the board had in that manner. So please state your name and, uh, for the, and address for the record. Uh, Chad O'Rourke, uh, 6 University Drive in Amherst. The, the bar address is 35 East Pleasant Street in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, okay. 01002. And then what, what else did you need? That's it. Nope. That's all we need, your name and, your name and address. All right. Um, so the, I think probably the best way to do this is to go through this document, which is entitled Requirements Needed for 5 11 2023. Um, are you, do you have that document in front of you, Mr. O'Rourke? I do. Is that the one that I, Rob, is that the one that I sent to you and, and, and copied and pasted the answer to? Yeah, then yes, I do have that one in front of you, Mr. Okay. O'Rourke. Okay. Let's just run through that. And, um, and so this will be shorter. So if members of the board have a question, responses, we can deal with it right at the time. We don't have to wait till the, uh, till the end and go through them all at once. So uh, I believe we have, you have a question. I believe we have answers to everything. So I don't think there was anything yep. that wasn't um, responded to, so. Okay, all right, let's go through it. So the first one is um, how to address the outside meeting queue in regards to what the number of patrons who can congregate in the line before getting kicked out, give a description of where the queuing will occur and how the onsite staff will manage and, and organize the line and list steps of how the onsite staff will control large gatherings outside the outside of the building. And you address that in your management plan, is that correct? Yeah, I made some adjustments in the management plan to it. I made sure that when I, I set the management, updated management plan to uh, to Rob, that I, I highlighted them in red, the changes that we made, so that it was obvious to where I responded to those particular um, things. One of, the, one of the parts of this was, I believe, Mrs. Marshall, I think it was your question regarding the queuing on the sidewalk there. And, and um, you know, my, I, I had reached out to my architect and, and his design um, did include the entire sidewalk uh, to come up with that capacity. His, uh, his response to it was basically that it's a private sidewalk and that anybody that was accessing the street, Prey Street using the public way should be using the public sidewalk on the other, uh, the other side, which is why he designed it that way. We did limit it to a, um, I think his, I, I don't have the exact number in front of me. I believe it was 390. Uh, we were limiting it in the management plant to 300, but it's a more controllable number. Um, so we did it that way. There's been there's been times in the past uh, where you know, especially during the COVID days, where we were restricted to capacity, d distance, separation, all those type of things that had had come up on our sidewalk. And um, you know how we responded to that was simply having staff have to go up to our patrons and say, "Sorry, you you can't be here." Uh, I mean, it is a public way. At the end of the day, there's only so much we have. But you know, to be honest, in all the years we've done this they listen because they have to. So, um, you know, we, we, we have an excellent relationship with the police department. If we have the need to enforce anything uh, beyond that, we do, we contact them, we have a direct line to them. So most of the time when we, when we ask somebody, you know, take a walk around the block and come back when the line's uh, shorter, they, they essentially do. So I think in this particular situation, um, that's how we, we would have to respond to it. But the queuing, to answer your question directly, which I think was where this came from, was uh, was that how is how it was designed in, in his design. Ms. Marshall. Can I respond? Thank you. Um, so a couple things. Uh, you you mentioned, you just mentioned, you, you made two statements that 
aren't reflected in this red text, but they were exactly what I was wondering, which is if that sidewalk is private or not. If it is private, then I don't I don't know if we have any any authority to um, change the queuing plan. I mean, I just don't know. Um, but the the your architect seems to think that that people only use the sidewalk if they're going back and forth between buildings in that area. And that is not true because there is through traffic up to Triangle Street and down to East Pleasant through there. Um, but what he was saying is the public the public way is the other side of the street. Prey yeah. Street has the public sidewalk on it. Right. And then our sidewalk is private, but okay. Okay. I think to answer your question, you do have the right. I mean, yeah, you guys, all right. <laughs> you guys well, are making the rules. So, I mean, if you guys have a suggestion to make for us, then obviously we are certainly here for that purpose. So, yes, you have every right to to, to suggest the stuff. But it is it is a private a way, private way at that point. Okay. Uh, I have noticed. I'm sorry. Yeah, I have noticed that since our last meeting um, at your current location, you're now putting up portable fences to make sure that half of that public sidewalk is is free. and. That's much appreciated. Yeah, and we could do the, you know, that I, I think I had put a, I put a note in here that mm -hmm. th th they've been terribly successful. Um, and so the, the use of portable line stanchions could, would certainly an, an element that we can entertain. Um, you know, the concern I would have, and I think the concern you guys would have is, is to make sure that we that those portable stanchions wouldn't be blocking the egress way, uh, and we right. would, wouldn't intend to do that. We, you know, they would be designed to not be uh, in the, the egress of, of those doorways. Um, but that's certainly, you know, if, if, if it's okay with the, the zoning board as we, we move forward with that to use those stanchions, they, they've worked fantastically. I mean, that's what Uptown Amherst did for many, many years to, to control the population that was up there. And again, I, I would, we wouldn't put one um, in direct resistance to the, the egress, but we could certainly use them to control crowd management. You, um, I think that makes sense, but I would want, and. I'm not prepared to, to approve a plan and I don't think you're prepared to provide a plan tonight on the stanchions, the uh, portable ones. But I think a, a condition that makes sense would be to uh, would be to reference the, um, that you may want to create a plan with portable stanchions and have that approved by the building commissioner. Um, we, I don't think we need to come back to the ZBA for that. But we may not need to. We may not need to. But you have, as much yeah, as, may not. Yeah. But if you're going to use them, the, qu the concern I have is that they could be misplaced and could block the exits. I, yeah. I agree with that. So if we can have a condition that says if, a, if portable stanchions are used, it's a plan that should go to the building commissioner for approval to avoid um, blocking the exits on the, on the sidewalk. Something to that effect. Yep. Okay. That makes sense to me. All right. I think that'll be addressed too when we, as we go through this and we touch on the, um, the elevated lip there of the the curving yep. that's part of the discussion of that too. I'll so be we'll there next. Yep. The next is on desk. Any other questions on the sidewalk? If not. Let's go to the decibel levels. Um, so um, the question was whether uh, what's what are going to be the decibel levels inside the, the building and whether there be um, um, will be a health effect upon workers or patrons. Can you please tell us how you responded to that? Yeah, so in my research, and I think Rob, in, in what Rob had discovered too, from what I saw in his response here is there, there is no there is no regulations, laws, uh, or standards. Uh, this is my response that I'm reading right now to, to address the risk of, of the hearing damage from music venues, concerts, nightclubs. There, of course, are studies. There's many studies pertaining to the, the noise, uh, noise-induced hearing loss based on those. And so 85 decibels is considered the action level for at which point hearing protection is suggested and encouraged. Um, and then 90 decibels to 90 decibels for those that would be exposed more than eight hours and 100 decibels for those uh, that would be exposed less than eight hours over the longevity. And I, I just uh, read the, the thing that Rob, I, I think it was Rob that had attached it to uh, to this, and I, I think that adds right up to my research as well. Um, and being that you know it's long term exposure, um, I, I don't know if this falls in that classification. Again, there's no requirements to any of that. Uh, we certainly are happy to provide hearing protection to uh, staff that would want to, that would have desire to use it. I, we have no problem with that. Um, I've never had staff that have 
wanted to do that. I don't think rock, rock concerts. I mean, if you've gone to a, a typical concert concert, like a real true outdoor rock concert, you do see staff members usually have ear protection in their ears in and around those, those speakers. That's a different level, uh, certainly than, than what we're talking about here. So, um, you know, um, again, I've never personally had any staff member that has, uh, indicated a desire to have hearing protection um, and, and then patrons I don't think are exposed to it long enough for that to be a concern at a volume that would be a concern at least. So what is your what is just, just second Mr. O'Connor what is what do you think your uh, anticipated decibel level will be the high level? Uh, we, used the we used 100 decibels um, as the threshold for it that's the standard um, decibel rating of, of of what you consider a nightclub to be. Mm-hmm and then and that and then you base the reduction for the outside um, noise level to be uh, 50 decibels below that is that what you're looking at so 100 yeah. is what you're we have to obtain 70 at, at the prim at, the, at right. the perimeter and so we do think we can achieve 50 um you know for for the exterior obviously that doesn't answer mr o'connor's concern of the interior premises at this point because right. at that point we're talking about reduction on the outside of the perimeter of the of the the building and I think that the concern was more of, of the interior aspect of things. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Mr. O'Connor? Am I but, answering your question correctly? It's yeah, it's the interior. And when it's my turn to speak, I'll explain yep. my concern. And do you have any measure do you have any measuring device that you keep in, in inside for double uh, decibel level measuring? Do you do that? We, we do not. We, we don't. Okay. We, we haven't. We haven't needed to. To be honest with you, uh, yeah. of that. you know, there hasn't been a concern that we've had to address uh, to to do that. So no, we don't. Okay, Mr. O'Connor. Yes. Uh, so the the reason I raised this issue is because um, the applicant um, indicated that the the music that would be provided when we talked about the interior layout was that it would be um, uh, pre-recorded music. Um, it's very hard to control um, live entertainment. And of course, I don't believe that it would be possible to, to set a, a standard for live, in, live indoor entertainment. But with regard to um, any recorded entertainment uh, and music that would be provided, um, at the facility. Um, my view is that the, that, that that can easily be controlled and that the, the, uh, the control should be that the decibel level set for the pre-recorded uh, music should be below the level where there could be damage. Now, of course, hearing damage occurs not, you know, even within the working, you know, lifetime of of somebody who who may be here for college or whatever. You're, you're not going to notice it. You're going to notice it when people are in their late 30s, early 40s, maybe 50s. So I, my view is that we have an obligation under Article One to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the inhabitants, and that the best way to do that with regard to the interior noise level is to add. We, we can't control whatever else additive noise happens, but we can ask the applicant and should uh, ask the applicant to uh, to set the for pre-recorded uh, music or sound that the that the decibel level be at 85 that's easily controllable by the applicant and uh, it would um, it would minimize the damage done to not so much to the patrons because as he said it's correctly said that they're usually not there long enough to experience it but, and, and this was the issue for uh, smoking, indoor smoking. It wasn't, the indoor smoking regulations were not directed at the patrons. They were directed at the employees. Um, and so somebody who's on site for five hours um, a day um, 
no matter whether they're shifted around during that time or not, um, will be exposed to a level of noise <clears throat> that I think we should be concerned about. Um, and so I, I think we should ask the applicant and make it a condition of the permit, um, if granted, that, um, that the recorded music um, that is being provided uh, be set at an 85 decibel level. Of course, the, the, no, the level may go up because of, of other noise that's generated conversation and so forth. But with regard to that which can be controlled by the applicant, I think it is reasonable to ask. And I, and I also think that because so many of the employees functions have to do with the bartenders, the people at the door and so forth, they have to do with um, interacting with the public and speaking and hearing from the public that and patrons that um, I think the idea that individuals can use um, uh, earplugs and so forth, th those are really for works, you know, for construction sites and auto assembly plants and other places that have severe noise. That's not, that, that's not a practical <clears throat> solution to a situation where you have intense public interaction by the employees. So I, I think the yeah. requirement of 85 decibels for pre-recorded music is, is a reasonable one and the board should adopt that as part of any permit they grant. Ms. Marshall. Oh, Mr. O'Rourke, do you wanna respond? I would like to respond. I mean, my yeah. application is for a nightclub and I don't think 85 decibel rating uh, is reasonable to be approved for a nightclub, which we all know the decibel rating of a nightclub is, is 100. So that threshold might be reasonable. And I guess my question would be, is there, a night, is there a decibel restriction at the Drake, which is a live music venue as well? So if there's not one at the Drake, why are we putting a restriction on the nightclub here to something that doesn't have standards or laws or anything set forth in any other facility anywhere? That would be my, my question and my response to it. But. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, my understanding, I don't know whether the Drake was subject to a special permit, but I think part of our responsibility as as the the deciders on special permit requests is to to enforce the entire bylaw um i don't know most of those other permits may have been in fact granted under sections of the bylaw that don't require special permits um but this one is subject to <clears throat> special permit request. And my reading of the bylaw suggests that we ought to, in fact, um, uh, implement Article 1 of the of the bylaw when we consider these types of requests. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Sloviter. Well, I have a few general comments on this particular point. <clears throat> And I am somewhat uniquely aware of sound levels because I'm married to an audiologist. So it's just something that is part of what I'm aware of. I don't think that this entire topic is reasonable to impose on the interior space of a nightclub. I'm only concerned with the sound outside the club and the effect that it has on the general public. Uh, I don't believe that the, um, that there's any parallel here to smoking. Secondhand smoke is imposed on people who are in a space for other reasons. Uh, everybody who is in attendance at a club is there voluntarily with full knowledge of the sound levels that they're likely to encounter. Uh, the Drake is so loud that my son, and I know this is anecdotal evidence only, was there for a concert and chose to leave because it was so loud. And I don't think it's fair to 
impose a specific sound level on one facility and not on others in the town. Personally, I don't care who selectively chooses to injure their hearing by going to a, a place that's too loud. I'm not indifferent to it, but I don't think it's our business to, to do this. If, if there are OSHA standards that somebody on any site, whether it's a construction site or a nightclub are supposed to meet, then let OSHA enforce it, not the planning board of the town. So I, I'm not in favor of hands off everything by any means, but in this particular case, it's a nightclub with known characteristics. And I don't think that we should be concerned about what goes on inside the club. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about criminal activity. I don't think we should be concerned about what goes on inside the club if it has no effect on the general public. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Uh, Ms. Marshall. Okay. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Um, I agree with Mr. Slobiter, also with Mr. O'Rourke's points. Um, it's really quite unfair to impose, uh, to re for one business to be forced to adhere to such a requirement. I also think there is no limit to the number of restrictions that we could put on um, if we wanted to in the name of health. You know, we could, we could say, well, we don't think you should serve more than two drinks to anybody because alcohol is, mm -hmm. is bad for you. I mean, these mm -hmm. are, everyone who's coming in here, I believe is over 21 and they're adults. And um, the worker, the employees themselves, I believe do have recourse to OSHA. If, you know, they think there's a problem, the general industry standard is 85 decibels averaged over eight hours. Um, so again, this venue is only open for five hours at a time. So it would be scientifically improper in my view to have a ceiling of 85 in any case. Um, but yeah, I disagree with this whole notion. Thank you. So what I, this, we're getting into a, a discussion about whether we have, uh, impose a condition or not. Right now, we should. Right now, we should be discussed. We should be getting answers from the examining what the proposal was from the applicant. We, when we get to the conditions, is when we should be discussing amongst ourselves as to whether it's a re responsible condition or not. I wanted to let this go on a bit because it's an interesting discussion, but I think we'll, we'll be returning to it under the conditions. So, unless there's a new point to be made regarding the applicant's response, I'd like to move on to the next portion of the next response from the applicant. Okay. Um, so the next one is regards the fire department. Um, can you respond there, Mr. O'Rourke? Yep, I have uh, spoke with um, uh, Jason Skills from the town and I have spoke with uh, the fire department and it is already in the works that we are going to put a, um, a new hydrant in between uh, the suggestion where, again, we're working with Jason Skill on it, so it'll be determined uh, officially, um, but they've suggested that on Prey Street in one of the um, grass islands that are over there, sort of in between the two buildings, the existing building and the new building, that we would install a fire hydrant there. It is town property. I've already volunteered to happily pay for it because it benefits both my buildings. Um, and so these, that would solve the problem. I think um, during um, Mr. Olson's um, surveying of the area, it determined that the current building might be in violation of, of 100 feet away as well. And so to solve the problem uh, of both, two birds with one stone, as he put it, we just put a new uh, fire hydrant and uh, on Prey Street there, and we would we would be within 100 feet of both. So that is already in the works. Uh, should obviously, should this get approved and we continue to move forward, it will be a part of it. So that's uh, that's an easy solution there. 
So is that going to be part that be part of your management plan, or does that need to be part of a um, uh, a design plan that's submitted to the? I think that has to be part of a site plan. Um, I, I would think. So. I, I could be wrong. I, I don't believe so. I think that just goes through Amherst Fire Department. So it doesn't have to be approved by the planning. Mr. Wachilla, can you tell us? Uh, no. So in this case, he has to get it permitted with the fire department. So the board doesn't really need to require it in their site plans. Um, but right. you could make it a condition that he does install the fire hydrant and works with the fire department. Yeah, we can do that. All right. Oh, well, the next one deals with the curb situation and the emergency egress. And that was something that both Mr. O'Connor and, and I brought up. Can you respond on what? And with the, the real question was, take a look at it and come back with us on your thoughts about how you can deal with the safety of the people coming out, deal with the emergency situation, the lip that's there. Give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, and, and this is a topic that I don't honestly know that amongst any of us will have a, a true solution because I think that um, all of us see both sides of the, the fence on this one. And, and it's it's tough because you solve one problem, but you create another. And so it's mm -hmm. sort of finding that happy medium. I did speak with Wendy Jones, who owns the building, and she said, whatever we need to do, uh, that we, we have her support. So that's not an issue. Um, you know, the suggestions of maybe making a curb cut right in front of the egress only is there. Um, certainly the topic of putting a railing up, I think that one was thrown out really quickly because we know that, you know, the concern there would be a clustering of, of uh, patrons being able to come out and the, everyone I talked to said, I'd rather see a broken arm than, you know, uh, someone in danger. Um, and so the raised curbing was designed, uh, according to Wendy Jones, when that building was, was put in, that raised curbing was designed to uh, prohibit the uh, a, vehicle from being able to leap the curbing uh, into the building and hit a patron, hit the inside of the building, whatever it might be. Uh, it actually did happen in the past uh, at one of the areas where the curb cut wasn't there. Um, she had told me that and luckily nobody was hurt at the time. So the design is intentional. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily have a solution to the problem other than the building owner myself. And I think a lot of people we talked to the solution was to that there shouldn't be a change that it was designed for that intention and so um yeah i mean i i don't know it's tough because again there's i, I you see i see both sides of everything and i think everybody does and, and if we solve it one way do we is it detrimental to the other i don't know i i think that's my impression of your answer is that that you, you have dealt with and examined a pretty um con conflicted situation I see, but I too see both sides. Uh, in your management plan, I think you talked about keeping people away from you managing the line outside by reducing the number of people that could be in the line to 300 from 360, 380, or whatever the number was. It's con conceivable that could be put on that sidewalk to reduce it to 300, and you keep them. If I understand it correctly, you keep them clear of the the doorways. We do, yeah. And and, and that is done because you have people outside, doormen that would monitor that and in case of an emergency that doorway would be cleared and we wouldn't have, you wouldn't have to move people out of the way that it would be cleared up already because it wouldn't be any stand anybody standing in front of the doorway is that correct and, is even, that and even more importantly yes and even more importantly we we have staff members inside at that station so that is okay. required we've done that ever since i've taken over the existing spoke we've always had a doorman um, i think we, we discussed this last time every one of those exit egresses has a doorman whose job is to stay there we provide extra staff members so that those staff members do not have to move around um, they do rotate through and so yeah that that there is someone at those point of of exit and egress at all times uh, in addition to the staff members that we have on the outside monitoring the line as well so yes and and lastly, the notion of just taking the lip down in front of the egresses, so if you avoided it, is a possibility. That I think there's only one. I, I, if I remember correctly, and I, I would have to double check on this, the the one on the far right of the building, which used to be Old Town Tavern and Charlie's, is already uh, open. The, the one on the far side, which was the laundromat, has a far enough uh, egress away. It's 15 feet at that point from the door. Um, that wouldn't be a concern. I think the one we're, we're all really mainly would be talking about would be the middle one, which used to be the right. general. Cruise. That is 
absolutely, as you walk out that door, you walk into a raised curb at that point. If you were to okay. continue to say that. Okay, so Mr. that's Chair. that's a is a possibility. We may look at that, Mr. Yes. O'Connor. Yes. Um. Yeah. I just. Um. I don't think this has to be an all or nothing situation. Um. With regard to the um, to the protective curbing. Uh, uh, with regard to cars that were parked um, alongside the building. I, my, my understanding of what I have thought from the beginning was to, um, was at the, up in the, in the street opposite the entrance that is the center, the center entrance, not the one on the west side, which the applicant just spoke about, or the one where there's a large area to congregate outside, and and is not likely to be the main in, exit for a large number of patrons, except those in the bathrooms. Um, that uh, that that cent that center entrance. I think is a good candidate for the removal of both the parking space and and the curb so that people can exit the building safely, not run into an automobile, but have some kind of a of a crosshatched area that is indicated that's not to be parked in and that it's it would be um, continuously clear for uh, patrons exiting the building. And I, I think that that's the, that's the only concern that I have with regard to, to that. It's, it's not removing all the, all the uh, raised curbing because I think it's useful um, for the parking spaces that would remain. But I think that one parking space in front of the exit um, should be, uh, that should be removed and the curbing should be removed and the, and the access to the street, because the sidewalk is not that wide, uh, should, should be completely clear. So when you walk out the door or maybe go out the door faster than at a walk, you have a clear space in front of you. And I think that's the safest way to, to deal with it. The one question I have with regard to this is, to the applicant is when those doors are opened, we're both opened in a, in a situation where the patrons are asked to, to leave the building. Um, is there a way to secure the doors so that they don't pull back into the patrons? Is there a, is there a way to do that? Um, that you've that you've thought through, the used at other buildings or so forth. Um, yes, I'll respond to all that. So uh, regarding the removal of the parking spot, I couldn't disagree more, and I guarantee the Jones properties will disagree with you completely as well. They are seventy-two inch egress walkways outside of that doorway. Code requires sixty inches, so we're beyond code. Um, there's no reason whatsoever if we were to cut that curb out that that parking spot should be removed other than the safety of the of patrons because the curb cut was removed, that would then work against the reason to have the curb cut. Um, to respond to, for your doors, yes, we already have them, the existing building, every single one of our doors has flipped down um, door stoppers. So as you go out the door, they are flipped down and left open. That's at, at the end of every night as we exit the building, as our patrons exit the building, those doors are held open by a door stopper that keeps them open. And that would be the, the same thing on, on those doors to, answer your question so yes okay all right miss marshall um i wonder if a, a middle ground <laughs> is to remove the curb in front of that door but allow for parking during the day there isn't generally any parking there when the club is open but you could in any case put some cones in that spot to keep someone from parking there. The yeah. only possible downside is that parking during the day, could the vehicle jump, is it with the gap anyway? So you see, but wouldn't have to permanently remove a spot perhaps. All right, 
a good a good point for discussion when we're talking about conditions. The next one deal. The next issue I think deals with um, um, fire department. We dealt with most of this, but um, you got to test. You're going to test for radio frequency, and you're going to get the fire department's approval, yeah, right? Part of the permitting okay. uh, with yep. them, anyways. They come in and for their final inspection, and will um, they would do that anyways? Yeah, that's already should be resolved. And the next is lighting. Can you please discuss what you how you responded on lighting? Um, where am I looking at that on here? See the attached pictures. I think where it shows. The... Oh, the, the lighting. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, 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 do you guys have the pictures there of the, this, of the lighting? I'm sorry if they weren't. This uh, is what you're talking it's about, right? Great, it's, it's very well lit. Uh, I tried to provide the best pictures I could to, to show uh, in, in all different directions of, uh, of how well lit that area is. Obviously, I think all the businesses at this point, especially because the ones that have to go before design review board, downward lighting is always a consideration in everything we do. Um, that building has that awning out front with can LED lights that face downwards. It's extremely well lit in the front sidewalk. Uh, the entire uh, current Jones Properties building is all lit up around it. We have um, we have floodlights that face downwards that light up each one of the corners of that building. The only thing, and I think I mentioned it in here somewhere, the current, um, what will be our entrance point, which is the side of the building that the work is currently being done on. I do have a, uh, a large um, LED downward light. It's a, it's a post light. Uh, it's installed. It just when um, it's unwired currently. So when the uh, electrical permit's done and the new wiring for that particular light is reinstalled, that light will let, illuminate that entire side as well. So I think it was Ms. Marshall that had asked about um, the side of that building, if the if it was appropriate lighting. And I think those pictures will show you how well lit the, the bank's parking lot is. There is a, um, a public, uh, I guess it's private light as well. One of the big tall High pressure sodium lights um, right there in front of the building. I actually have both sides of it as well. And that's on the drawing. That light, the LED light you're talking about, is on the, the plans. Yes. Okay. All right. Miss Marshall. Yes. So, um, first of all, I was wondering if you know the time of night or evening when these were taken, because they, we were also uh, wondering if the parking lot was indeed. Um, yeah, that was fairly correct. vacant. So do you know what time of day or Friday day? at nine yeah. o'clock? Yeah, it was the, the pictures that uh, are provided to you right there. I think there's three of them. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Friday at nine o'clock was the, the pictures there. Uh, one of the things that's currently happening with us that will will not happen, hopefully very much in the future is we're inundated with um, with construction worker vehicles. right now. <laughs> Um, and I'm actually in cooperation with uh, Western Builders, who is overseeing the job behind us to allow them to use our parking lot during the daytime. Um, they're abusing it a little bit, parking in front of the Jones Properties building. We're resolving that issue. So at the moment, there has been much more use during the daytime of, of our parking lot, which is almost mm -hmm. completely vacant during the daytime. And I think that general area of well, the construction is going on, but it's very obvious of what they are, the pickup trucks, they're utility body trucks, but they're everywhere in that neighborhood. So we've seen, like I said, we've been inundated with uh, much more traffic than, than we've, we've had in the past, but this is in general patron traffic that we've been seeing. So, um, and, and, and that right now has been leaving by five or six each night anyways, but. Uh, they're not there when you're, when you're, they're not there when you're open. Correct. I just wanted to bring that up because anyone that drives through right now would, would notice uh, the amount of uh, vehicles that are, that are over there. So, but to go back to the lighting, um, Ms. Marshall, I think you were the one that addressed that. And I just wanted to, to follow up on that to, you know, if you, to provide you with that picture. Like I said, the bank, in the bank parking lot, there's a high pressure sodium light, which is one of the ones provided by the utility company. And then at the, in my current building parking lot, not the parking directly out of the back of the building, but the second half of that parking lot between mm -hmm. that and the public, public parking lot, there's another high pressure sodium light right there as well. Um, and that's in addition to all the um, perimeter lighting that we have around each of the buildings. So it's a very well lit area. Right. I think my question though was, uh, I, uh, I specific to the this, signage, uh, the sign, the whether yeah. this ambient, this existing lighting was adequate to illuminate your signs because clearly the side below, it's very the sidewalks are very well lit. Yeah. But the question is above. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and it is, um, I, you know, when I when I discussed with the design review board regarding uh, an illuminated light box there versus the standard um, sign that we use, I prefer not to use an illuminated light box. Uh, it, to me, it's it's not. We're not. I don't want neon signs in my windows. There, I, I don't. We're just. We're something that doesn't need more attention than it needs. Um, and so for me, I have no desire to put an illuminated light box. I have no desire to put signage. I just kind of want to keep it very, very simple. You guys know with this, you've, you've been in this town long enough, it's not going to be a secret we're there. We don't have to advertise to anybody. It's a student-based market. It's a student-based business. Um, they know we're there. They will come, I, I, you know, outside of the perimeters of safety concerns, um, you know, from a, an advertising perspective of things, I, I don't, see the need for that. So, but it is illuminated enough to know what is there, yes. All right. Um, the next is the ride share pickup area. You That's included with a, um, a draw, a site plan, um, which shows where the uh, the cars will, the, the ride shares will park. And that's just that's in, in front of the parking spots it's on the here. public way we use it currently it's Prey street um you know there's that that sort of that nook that's in front of the the banks area between us and the bank um where the the dead area is that is is owned by the the building behind us uh which they're doing nothing with right now it's the entrance point for the construction area um we we strongly uh discourage uh rideshare uber any of those ones from from coming on the main street which would be east pleasant street out the front building um, and so everybody is always directed down uh, Prey Street. It, it makes sense because it's such a quiet area for them to go. It's a, you can come in from East Pleasant Street, go out onto College Street very simply without getting any any jams. Um, and so we've always done that. It's been a habit for us to do it, um, and that's a, a great area of, uh, off the beaten path area for them to do that. So um, it hasn't been problematic in the past. We've, we've uh, like I said, it's kind of tried and true for us. Any questions about the rides here, Ms. Marshall? Yeah, sorry, did you say that this this hatched area that belongs to Archipelago or whoever it is? And no, and it's the public way. It it's is on, the, okay. it's Prey Street. Yeah, it's the public it's, way. It's where the entry it's where the currently the construction right. vehicles are. But they don't own it. They, they don't own that. No, yeah, it's it, okay. that's just the entrance point. Uh it's it would, you know, if they if they were to have gates there one day, it might be different because they would have an entrance point into Prey Street. But um, you know their site plan that they they submitted is fencing in that area and kind of creating a dead area over there yeah. for future use. Um, so it's a it's a great little uh, pickup area that we've used already. Thank you. Um, Timestamp photographs of the back lot. Um, I think you've already provided those. Uh, yeah, that was the one where I, I used both yeah. the, to show the illumination and and um, right. you know the. the Kind of how quiet it is really back there. Um, obviously, during the daytime, it's a different, it's a very different subject. Um, you know, Jones Properties has many businesses in there. Uh, parking is a commodity. You know, during the daytime back there, which is one of the reasons we didn't, we wouldn't. I don't think anyone would want to entertain removing any parking as it is. I think the luxury we have of being down this part of town is that we don't have parking requirements, but we have parking. Uh, that's a unique thing in in our downtown district. So we don't want to give up any of that if we get. All right, and then we've gone, I think we've gone through all the submissions that um, questions that we had in your submissions. Um, the last, the only thing that I would do is if people wanted to run, read through the, um, the uh, management, the amended management plan. I had a couple Mr. of questions Chairman. about that. Right, just a second, Mr. O'Connor. Yep. I had a couple of questions about your management plan. So the doorman, I just wanted to make sure I understood. You said you'd, you have a lead doorman. Inside, you have three doormen. You have two at the front door. You have two floaters and one. So you have at, you have nine uh, doormen on 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 staff. All the about time, right? the, yeah. for, the, for the proposed for the sure. new building, yep. we would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Correct. Yep. Okay. And and there the floaters go around, and the three that are assigned to those doors. Um, Correct. So they rotate different. through um, sometimes when we have newer uh, employees that we do not that are still learning, we'll put them in, we'll kind of keep them in the, the, the easier areas to, to handle. But yes, throughout the, the night, our, uh, our lead door guy is, is always checking on everybody. We do rotate staff through most every one of our spots so that there's uh, 
so people just don't get complacent is what it is. Got it. Okay. Mr. O'Connor, you had a question. All right, that's all the questions I had on the management plan. Go ahead, Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, so at the bottom of the um, sheet that I have, there was a issue of addressing the, the long hallway to the bathrooms because there's oh, an exit. Right. I'm sorry. And, right. and, um, and, and I guess I raised that issue um, and my concern is that um, I don't know if if the members of the board can imagine what five feet is, um, or they have a space that is five feet wide that's immediately available to them, but five feet wide is is about the width of a of a bicycle lane plus maybe the curb and the actual line that demarcates the um, bicycle lane from the, the motor vehicle lane. And as such, that is, in my opinion, not a situation that I would not like to have a situation where in an emergency patrons are going to be trying to go down that five foot wide hallway to the exit that is opposite the bathrooms. Uh, partly, simply because if, if in a five foot hall wide hallway, one person stumbles, trips, falls or whatever, um, it's going to lead to a very bad situation. And, um, and I, I don't know how to resolve that. But, you know, one thought I had was that the, that there be a way to, to close off that hallway in an emergency so that people are directed to the, the three, the entrance now turned exit and the other two exits that are double by doors, but not, um, but but accessible through a, a very wide area, the, the main gathering area. And I, I think that hallway is a potential problem in an emergency. And I would not like to see um, um, people trying to travel down that hallway to get to an exit. Um, obviously, it, it has to be available for people who are in the bathrooms and maybe for some of the staff who who could exit out that from the, uh, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that that hallway is a safe way to exit a, um, to go to get to the outside for a large number of people in an emergency. And I, if the applicant has some thoughts about it or the other board members do, but I just think we ought to think about that because it's these kind of, of narrow passageways that um, unfortunately lead to serious injuries. If all you take, all you need is one person to go down and you, you then have a terrible situation um, unfold. Am I able to respond? Mr. Yeah. Um, so the only suggestion I would make to the board is that opinion should not get in the way of code requirements. Um, code requirements are 44 inches for a commercial corridor. Um, we are 60 inches. So we are greatly beyond the code requirement of a corridor. Um, obviously, Rob Moore can speak on behalf of that. And I think it should be the building commissioner's job to enforce that, not the board's job to enforce that. I agree with Mr. O'Connor. Obviously, we always take safety into consideration. That's the most important thing to us. That would be the one detriment to our business if, if something should happen along those lines. So certainly we we take it into consideration, but I do not think that there should put requirements in here that are already uh, controlled by a code. And we are controlled by a code on that. Well, Mr. Chairman. Uh, briefly, yes, Mr. O'Connor, go ahead. Yeah, I, if, if the... Mr. Mora would be deciding this application if it were simply a matter of enforcing the code. Our job is um, 
beginning with Article One and and including 10, Section 10.38 is larger than the code. And we have an obligation to the public that might be inside this building in an emergency to see to use our best judgment as to how how things should be structured to provide um, safe exiting from the building in an emergency. And I'm sorry that you know one of the one of the things that happens after tragedies in establishments like this is discussions about amending the code. Um, and there are many structures that are, are simply decided by a building commissioner, uh, erected as to the code, and then when there is a tragedy, um, th then people point the finger at the code and they look at things and so forth. That's not our situation here. This is a special permit. We have an obligation beyond the code to make sure that uh, the exiting uh, procedures from this building and the uh, are, are safe in an emergency. And I think we should exercise that responsibility. Other comments, other questions on the management plan? Uh, Mr. Wachilla. I caution the board members to be careful when referencing other codes um, because the building codes gonna govern any sort of dimensional requirements of the building itself, right? The fire code's gonna suggest the number of egress they're supposed to have and location of hydrants, which are totally acceptable and fine. But I feel like if we get into the specifics of each of those codes in this special permit and don't let those codes enforce each of those rules themselves, then that can be problematic. and. I was having a conversation with Mr. Moore earlier about this, and he had mentioned that it's okay to ask these questions about the HVAC system and then the hallway width and, and whatnot, but at the end of the day, before they get the building permit, that's going to be addressed later on anyways. But the concern that Mr. O'Connor has about the crowds going towards that exit that's across from the bathroom, I could see where he's coming from, but you also have to remember there's three other exits that are closer to the main area and more convenient for people to go out anyways. So I don't know if that's something the other board members had in mind as well, but that's just kind of a, a thought that, that came up while I was listening to this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last thing I'd like to do is we've had discussion of, or questions about the ventilation system. I think you, Mr. O'Connor, uh, had questions about the ventilation system. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's my understanding is that um, there's a, process where they're not going to get a um, occupancy certificate until the ventilation system is deemed to have met the code uh, for the building. Uh, but you had a question about it. And so I think that um, one of the things we do, I'm inclined to leave that to the code and make sure that it, there's sufficient ventilation there by the, by the code, because I can't judge that. I'm not, I'm, I'm just not competent to make a judgment on whether the code is is, quality, is right or not, but you had some questions about that. So I think is this the time to ask those questions of, and, but if we're, if we're gonna put a, if you wanna put a condition on, um, after we ask those questions, let's have the discussion about whether we do a condition or not later. Right. Just get well, some yeah. answers now. Yeah, yeah, my main my main concern with regard to the ventilation is that the, that the code cited was from 2015, which is pre, our experience with um, in, increased ventilation uh, recommendations. Um, and I think that, and I suggested um, that we get comparative data from other places where there are large gatherings to determine where this, where the ventilation, um, uh, uh, ex the extent of the ventilation that's contemplated for this uh, gathering place, um, where it falls uh, between among spa other sp similar spaces in terms of um, public occupancy. That was my main concern. Is this at the high end or at the low end? Is it in the middle? Um, do we feel comfortable uh, with a 
a reference to a 2015 code, which I think many events reveal have been superseded by events uh, quite larger than the code. I don't have an answer to your question, um, and I I don't know, Mr. Wachilla, do you have an answer to that? So I did talk to Mr. Moore about this earlier too. Um, he told me that um, the code for HVAC did not change because of COVID. I believe that was a question I was asked by by another board member um, over email. I think Sarah must have been you who who emailed me that question. Um, and I believe the code from 2015 is the one that's still being used by the inspectors and inspectional services. Um, I can verify that and see if there is a later edition that was released. Um, but to my knowledge, I was given that book to look over. I was told that was the most recent code that they're referencing for their inspections of buildings um, before obviously issuing their COs. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I pulled the information from. Um, I came to the conclusion after doing my research that it would be best if the applicant uh, works with an HVAC specialist that knows the code and can build it to the standards for that type of use to the Massachusetts building code. So a possible condition could be, um, must be designed to the standards of the Massachusetts state building code and then just kind of leave it at that. Um, and that was suggested from Mr. Moore himself. That has to be done anyway. I mean, that condition yeah. is almost yeah. frivolous because you, don't you can't get a certificate yeah. of occupancy without the building inspector coming and saying it meets the code. Mm -hmm. yep. But but that's a you know it could be done. Okay. Um, are there any other questions for the applicant, um, Mr. O'Connor? Another question? Yep. Yes, yeah, so I I actually um, it occurred to me after the first hearing that we had not. Um, this, the establishment is going to serve alcohol, correct? Yes. Um, um, and there's, and the applicants said there were going to be no places to sit in the, in the main, the, the place that's occupied by the patrons. And my question is, how how is it how are things going to work one are people who are going to be served alcohol be required to stand at the bar and drink or are people going to be circulating with you know paper cups uh, cans of beer bottles of beer throughout the establishment i quite frankly i'm i would be much more concerned about people walking around with beer bottles uh, than i would be that somebody would pick up a chair and do something with it and um so i i'd like to understand what happens w with the process of serving and consuming alcohol uh, in the establishment and um yeah. We do not use glass bottles. Uh, we do not use glass glasses. Uh, we only use plastic cups. We only use aluminum bottles. Um, and it's that easy for the protection of glass. I know you have a concern with that. Again, you know, I it, in encouraging the the board to consider the application I'm putting in for a change of use of the building. Those questions are sort of directing me and how I should operate my business. And I don't think that's necessarily a fair way to look at it, but to answer your question, to ease your mind on that, we do not serve anything in glass. Uh, we don't in the current building. Uh, we do not in the, in, and we will not in this building either. So if it's a concern over glass you have, um, that should be rectified right there. Uh, as far as patrons standing at the bar, they're free to roam wherever they want. Uh, generally a patron will bring their empty back up to uh, the bar when they get a, a new beverage. Uh, there's plenty of places for them, uh, trash cans for them to dispose of their beverages. Um, and in the design of the building, um, we could build in drink rails if we had to. Um, again, that's not a requirement that I think should be made by this board uh, in the design of my building for that, but uh, we could certainly 
you know, solve a problem of needing to put a drink down that way. But generally there's trash cans all over the place for them to dispose of their empty beverages. People hold them in their hands. It's a, it's a nightclub, it's a dancing nightclub. Um, and so yes, generally people will go up to the bar, get their drink. When they finish their drink, they'll return to the bar for another beverage with their, their empty beverage, if that answers and, your question. And Mr. Chairman, I, I just, I had a question. I understand the, the applicant's concern about um, movable or throwable uh, container, uh, uh, chairs, tables, and so forth. Um, I just wonder, I mean, in, in, given the occupancy level that is proposed, um, had the applicant considered some kind of um, benches along the, the wall of the building between, between the exits um, for those patrons who, who may um, need to sit rather than having to go outside and sit on the curb or something. Um, I haven't, I've been in a number of, of locations. I haven't heard of a place that had literally no place for anyone to sit other than the 10 stalls in the women's bathroom and the two in the men's. Um, and I just wonder if, if the applicant has considered that just uh, for somebody who may who may fall or faint or whatever, is there a place where that person could, uh, could temporarily um, be located? Um, so I guess that's a question for your design. Do you, what did you, Mr. O'Rourke? I mean, yeah, I've been in many places that didn't have places to, to sit down at. Um, I was just in some this weekend uh, visiting some friends and um, we have our staff members that sit at the exit doors do have chairs to sit on. So I suppose if there was an emergency, there would certainly be a place for someone to sit down uh, should they need to sit down. Um, that's the way this is being designed and this is the way this is being proposed is, is a nightclub. Uh, again, you know, I, I, I want you to keep in mind the proposal of the type of business that we're submitting here and not redesign the business based on uh, opinions of, of where things the board thinks should yeah. go. But I think it's a legitimate question to ask what your business model is. That's, yeah. I, that's what Mr. O'Connor is doing and that's a legitimate question. Absolutely, um, I agree. Yes. It's, no, it's a different question. question as to whether there's a condition or something placed on it, but to understand it so you can make an evaluation of the, the project is a legitimate question, I think. All right, any other questions for the applicant? All right, then I think the next thing is to um, open this up for public comment. Um, Rob, do we have people online in the participants who wish to speak? Uh, so we have two people. Um, so Pamela Rooney, who I believe is a town councilor, just raised their hand. Uh, do you want to? And before we open it up, I just want to make sure that we uh, would you re would you repeat how a person on the phone. Mm -hmm. who's not on the computer can access, can indicate that they wish to speak. Yes, I believe, um, sorry, I have to remind myself and see. I think, they have, to, I think they have to hit nine on their phone. Yes, mm -hmm. right. yep, they, have to, yep. they have hit to hit nine, nine, on, hit nine on your cell phone and I'll raise your hand if you're um, calling into this meeting. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so we do have Pamela Rooney who raised her hand. Do you want me to promote her yep. to panelists so she can talk? Okay. All right. Ms. Ms. Rooney, um, please give your name, your address, and uh, your remarks, and keep them for around three minutes. Thank you, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. Uh, given my close proximity to this site, my question has to do with trash management as part of a management plan. Um, given that plastic cups are the, the rule of the day, um, do those plastic cups come out with folks at the end of the evening? Um, I'm assuming you keep them all inside. They have to drink their beverage inside, but um, do you have plans for early morning pickup? Um, many property manage management companies uh, hire folks to do cleanup of their rental sites. Um, typically, you know, the morning after a weekend, uh, will something like that be available and possible here? Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ruin. I'm, I'm Mr. Uh, yep. Uh, you know what, Mr. O'Rourke, what we're going to do is 
give it the public a chance to ask the questions and we'll come back and you can respond to each one of them. I think this is the only one, but you can respond to each of them um, serially. Is there another, anybody else who wishes to speak or ask a question? All right, go ahead, Mr. O'Rourke. Uh, you I can respond. Ms. Rooney in the past and I, I, I appreciate her question. It's a great question. So um, we do, so uh, uh, one of the first duties, I think we addressed this in the in the last meeting and I'm not sure if Ms. Rooney was there to hear it. So. One of the first responsibilities of our doorman after exiting the patrons um, are to uh, circle the perimeter of the building. Um, and and Miss Rooney is welcome to come back on if, to respond to this. I believe our reputation is that we keep a very clean building. Um, we, we we do not allow. We try our best to not allow any trash pickup, uh, any trash buildup at any time. And like I said, at the end of the evening before the doormen go back inside to do any of their interior duties, um, they often circle the entire perimeter of the building and make sure that there's not um, cups or, or stuff that's left out there. Anything that would be out there would have probably been out there from before because we do not let anybody leave the building with any cups. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's water. We get the question all the time. People will try to exit the building with a cup in their hand. They'll say, this is water. And we, it doesn't matter because the perception is the perception it doesn't matter what you walk out with. Um, you're not allowed to leave the, perim the premises with a, an alcohol beverage. Nobody knows if it's alcohol or not. So we do not, we have the policy of not letting anybody leave with anything. Um, and that's always the way we've done it. And that's the way we will continue to do it. So that should alleviate the concern of people walking away with um, of any trash. But um, I think we do a, a pretty good job of, of keeping the prox proximity of our building clean. Um, and I, I think the Jones family would speak on our behalf for that as well, which is one of the reasons they were working with us to, to go to this place. I thought that was addressed in your uh, management plan and I'm looking at it here and I can't find it. Um, so, I thought it was as well. Yeah, I thought there was some, I thought there was a reference to it. Ms. Brestrup? I'm on the phone right now with Pam Rooney and she would like to come back into the meeting, but she can't seem to come back. Does anyone have any suggestions? Uh, yeah. do, does she have a meeting link? Do you, do we need to resend it to her? Um, how about if Rob Wachilla sent, resends you the meeting link? How about if she tells you her question? <laughs> or either. Let me try this real quick. Uh, um, okay. She got a message that said you're removed from the webinar. The okay. host has remo removed you from the webinar. So that is my mistake. I was trying to, um, oh. so I'm sending her another um, link and see if she could try it again. He's going to send you another link and, and you can yeah. try it again. And if it doesn't work, call me back. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. Before, while she's getting on, I think I found a reference, which mm -hmm. is at the end of outside queuing. Um, manage the outside line noise issues and they are, um, well, that's no, I just, I don't find, I don't find the cleanup responsibility here, but I know I read it. And so I think if, but I don't remember that you spoke in your management plan to no cups outside the establishment. Yeah, and I can that, put that in there if you want. I think that's, I mean, I would. That should be, it's a great a practice on every business. So, um, but sure. Right to your point. And I think it's, it's the point you made here, and I think that would make um, it, it's consistent with the, your your representation of your po of your policy. So let's put it in the management plan. Certainly. And also, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add that um, after discussing with Rob Mora uh, a possible condition that we include in that list of conditions um, in the PAR was to have a. Um, require the applicant to make sure the building is litter free. So from trash that comes from inside the business at the end of every shift. So that'd be the days you're open and of shift, you have guys go outside, pick up trash or anything like that. And then with the board's allowed to instill that as a condition too. Just want to make oh, everybody yeah. aware of that. <laughs> and I thought that was in the management plan, but we'll look for it and find it. Uh, and maybe we'll have to uh, reinforce it a bit, but it's in the, yeah. Ms. Brestrup, I saw your hand was up. Did you get a hold of Councillor Rooney? Um, yes, and she uh, was not able to get back in a second time, and she feels that she's just going to have dinner and not. <laughs> oh, well, I was there. Yeah. 
what I was going to suggest is that we read at 730. We're at a half halfway through. Um, mm -hmm. I would suggest that we take a, a, it's a good point for a five minute break because we've responded to the we've had public comment. We've responded to the public comment. We can come back and have any last questions from the from the board members and then we can move into the public meeting portion of this uh, of this whole um, of our consideration. And so it seems to me it's a good time. And if Miss Rooney wants to um, try again, uh, we can let her. We certainly let her come in um, when we get back from a, a quick five minute break. So unless there's any objection, we'll be back at seven thirty five. Um, we'll break for five minutes and resume in five minutes. Thank you. All right, we can restart. Uh, is everybody back? Good. Okay. So um, we've heard from public. We've heard the response from um, the applicant to the public comments. And it's a chance for the last comments from board members before we in the public hearing before we move to a public meeting where typically public comment will be at a minimum. So this is the last chance for board members to make a comment if they wish if in the public hearing portion. If not, I will, or last chance for you, Mr. O'Rourke, to say anything before we move to public, um, to our public meeting, which we typically will not have a lot of public comment at. We may call upon you for clarification, but. Oops, you're, you're, you're muted. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, again, if this is my last opportunity, I just want to you know encourage the board to please consider the fact that there are plenty of people that are going to enforce codes, uh, building inspector, electrical inspector, plumbing inspector, health inspectors, that um, when considering rules and things that you guys put in place that they are not opinionated 
subjects that override a code that is in place for things. That's all. Thank you. Okay. All right. Any comments from the board members? If not, I'd like to move to um, Oh, Mr. Connor, you're you're muted. Do you want to speak? Oh, you're muted. Is there somebody there to help you with the? Yeah. Okay, I go. think Mr. Wachola may have accidentally muted me. Okay. Um, you're... Bad. Anyway, um, so with regard to. Um, this the special permit it, i'll just say it's my view that that uh in light of the fact that the applicant said he has a 20-year lease um and so forth that with regard to section 10.384 i believe that the the board needs to require the installation of solar panels on, on all buildings that require a special permit uh, from this point on, especially not, not for uh, you know, the, the, the town fair that's gonna be there for a week, but for a building that's going to be there for 20 years, has a 20 year lease, um, uh, it's my, and I'll explain it in the in the public uh, meeting process. But it's my view that um, uh, ten point three eight four um, the will lead to that conclusion. All right, we can. That's something we can discuss during the public meeting portion and the conditions portions of the of the public meeting. Okay. All right. Yep. So um, unless there's objection, we're, I'm going to move to the public meeting portion. We keep the public hearing portion open. It is not closed in order that we could, we need to gather more information from the public. We can revert back to that. Or if we don't finish tonight, we can reopen the public hearing. But now we're in the public meeting portion, where typically that is where the board deliberates amongst itself, amongst themselves, board members amongst themselves. And in Mr. Chairman, do you need a motion to do that? No, we're just moving over. We don't need a motion. Okay. Um, and, and, and if somebody objects, we can vote, but I, I, there's no reason to, we don't need a motion. I have no objection. Yep, we, we don't need a motion for that. So um, this is where we generally, can, and I like to have a general consensus from, get a consensus of where people are th feeling about this, this application, where they'd like to go with it. Um, and then we can go through specific conditions impose we can decide on specific conditions those i think allow us to make the findings we're required to make i can't in many cases you can't make the findings you're required to make without the conditions that we choose to impose on the application and then we'll vote on the conditions and then we'll vote on the on the findings so this is a place where we get general comments um, but i'll start out i'm inclined to approve this um, i think it's that that's where the um I, I, this is entertainment central in, in amherst the existing owner of this property has um had a long history of, of um actually doing a pretty good job of running a bar i this is not a it's not a quiet business i've walked past that um the spoke several times recently since the last um since the last meeting we had, and it's a lot, you, you got a lot of people hanging out on the lines out in front, and you have a job to try to manage that um, that number of people, and you're gonna have a bigger job when you have 500 people uh, in your in your spoke live. Um, but I'm impressed with the um, the level of um, policing you have from your staff, and I've not seen them. I've not seen the patrons spilling out all over downtown. They seem to be pretty well corralled within their space. Um, in addition, I think that there are, I'm inclined not to impose additional <clears throat> limitations or restrictions beyond what is either the state code or the federal code on a business that I, unless I have some specific uh, knowledge or 
it's a, a very unique case, and, and I'm not I'm not convinced yet that uh, there are some specific uh, con, um, conditions here that we need to address outside the existing uh, regulatory framework, either federal, state, or local, um, beyond our general purview. Not that we couldn't if we chose to, but that I'm not inclined. I haven't seen that um, demonstrated yet. Um, lastly, I think I would. I'm inclined to like the curb cut in the middle exit door um, just because I think that's the one place where you could get push out to the side to get that sidewalk uh, seven inches down. I'm not going to fall on my sword on that. I'll leave it up to other people to to um, I'll leave it to the majority of the board, obviously, to, to decide on that. But I think that might be a good compromise. Um, it wouldn't impose a, a huge cost on the on the owner and uh, it might improve safety in case of God forbid there is an emergency when people are trying to get out in a hurry. So um, that's my general thinking on this. Um, and I think they've done a pretty good job with responding to the questions we had from last uh, our last meeting. So that's my general feeling. Um, I'd be happy to hear from other people as well at this point. Mr. Maxfield. Oh yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'm actually inclined to really just echo basically everything you'd said there. I, uh, I Where I live in the downtown, I'm sure, uh, not quite this point in the evening, but I'm sure later into the evening I'll, I'll be able to hear the noises of the uh, of the spoke before the night is over. But uh, you know, I think that's that's really something that comes with living in the downtown. Uh, this is, as you said, this is really kind of the uh, the place in town where to see it. And uh, yeah, I'm inclined to agree. I think uh, Mr. O'Rourke has done a good job in running that business and in, in doing it away to. Uh, in a way of, of maintaining a good relationship with the town. And uh, the only condition really at this point that, that I'm concerned about that I agree with you on there, it's that that cutout uh, for that door. I, I think there's, I, I'm willing to wager there's gonna be some consensus around that for sure. Um, but that is uh, really at this point, I, I'm inclined to support this, uh, to support this project. Mr. Slobiter, do you have a, a thought? Yes, I I um, I think that Mr. O'Rourke's presentation and his history of the operation of Spoke has been responsible, and he has he has responded positively to any any concerns that we have expressed. Um, I would say it's incredibly unlikely I will ever set foot in either Spoke. <laughs> once it's operating but it's not out of disdain for the operation it's just that it's not where i choose to go but i think that he has proven that he is a responsible business owner and i haven't heard anything that would uh, unduly alarm me i think that uh i think that what chair judge just said is right on target and i'm inclined to support it as well mr o'connor i don't want to leave you. you you spoke some of you spoke earlier a little bit about some of your concerns do you have additional concerns that you want to discuss here and i don't know I, I, I mean i would um i would be willing to permit the use um in this location with conditions and in my view we can discuss it at in terms of conditions mm -hmm. but i think a reduced um given the nature of the activities inside um i would i would say reduced capacity um but uh, with reduced capacity in some conditions, I would be willing to permit the use. Um, Thank you. Ms. Marshall, you don't have your hands up, but I um, uh -huh. think well, you might have an opinion. Well, yes, <laughs> you think? I do. Um, yeah, I, I'm, in, I'm in favor of this. I. Um, I'm wary of the impulse to micromanage somebody's business and to get outside of our outside of our lane. Um, I think that if the the curb 
in front of that that middle set of double doors is removed, which seems sensible. I we don't have a photograph of it, so I don't know. Is that directly in front of a parking space? So that we need to maybe make sure that there's a I forget what you call them those white concrete blocks at the front of a parking spot, you know, to keep the car keep vehicles from impinging, you know, jumping the curb, because I think still that's probably more likely than than um, a panic exit. Um, so we, you know, if we're removing that curb, we need to do something else to keep it, <clears throat> make sure the parking is safe. Um, I think that's, that's the only additional thing I would suggest. All right. Um, what I'd like to do is go through the conditions that the possible conditions that are included in the um, uh, project app, the draft project application report. And what I like to do with this, I think it makes the most sense. We'll go through them. And if anybody objects to any one of these, raise it and we'll vote on it separately. But I'd like to go through and, and, and um, approve on Blanc, um, in Block, excuse me, not on Blanc, in Block. Uh, as many as we can, and then we'll go back to the ones that have some controversy uh, separately. So the first condition is the project shall be built and maintained in accordance with the approved plans. This is standard language that we always say. Um, you got to do it because what you provide to us has got to be what you built. And for that I, I don't think there should be any question about the first one. The second one is that we're getting rid of a uh, an old special permit and there's a new special permit. So that makes sense as well. The applicant shall put the hours of operation on the entry door. This is recommended from the design review board. And I tend to want to um, uh, recognize what other boards do in town. Uh, they have a reason for that and it's fine with me. Um, the next one is the applicant should put the sign on the north side of the building showing main entrance this way. Again, a recommendation from the design review board. Design Review Board also uh, wanted all the awnings, doors, and trim to be white. I have no objection, and I don't think the applicant has any objection to it. Um, live or pre-recorded entertainment defined under Section 5.042 of the Zoning Bylaw shall be clearly accessory and incidental to the principal use. That means the principal use is a dance hall. This is music is live, and uh, pre-recorded music is incidental to that use. It's almost by definition what you're asking for. Um, I think we'll have some. I think we'll have some discussion about seven. So I'm, I'm going to move on beyond that, and not include this in my what I think are the ones that we'll approve in in block. Uh, building improvements recommended by the SPL system shall be completed before the the certificate of occupancy. That's the soundproofing, and then there shall be a test. The next one is at the test 14 days after the day, after opening. Um, Inspection services will have a, a letter certifying the sound level of the property line from SPL. The only question I have there is 14 days enough time. Um, will you have, you know, will you be able to know what you're going to be running, typically running a, your restaurant or your, uh, your nightclub at just in two weeks? And I'm wondering if 14 days should be, you know, 30 days so that we have some time that you, you know, when you can, you want to fine tune, so to speak, fine tune your operation. Yeah, 30 so, days is, re is reasonable, but I, I do think 14 days would be sufficient. I mean, that's two two full weekends of Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but yeah, 30 days, I think, would be the But it's also for neighbors, you know, for if neighbors to, in yeah. case there's a problem, so they can recognize it, so. Understandable, yeah. If, unless there's an, is there an objection to anybody to move that to 30 days? I mean, if you get it done in 14, you can still do it, but within 30 days, okay. So we'll, we'll, we're talking about that as an amendment to that condition. Uh, the next one is exterior lighting shall be designed or arranged to be downcast as part of our our um, our rules and regs. Um, it shall be extinguished at 2 a.m. if they're not specifically required for safety purposes. Direct spot lighting shall be used to illuminate the proposed signage rule signage unless the applicant can light the signage successfully with ambient lighting. So you've demonstrated, I think, you can that you can successfully light the signage with ambient lighting on the side um, and you have um, arc lights or those the really large lights in the front or you have led lights in the front is that correct 
Uh, correct. And there's that post light that actually is at the peak of the building that faces downward that will illuminate that entire area. So with it doesn't have direct light on the signage, but it illuminates the facade of the building there. So yeah. Ms. Marshall, you had some questions about the sign lighting of the signage. Is this is this acceptable to you this condition? Um well what what happens if it turns out that the signs on the buildings aren't particularly visible? Is is there a requirement that well then he has to have direct spotlighting if, if the So we're going to keep so we're going to keep that. I thought you yes, were proposing yes. to eliminate it. No, no, no. I'm, oh. I'm proposing to keep it. Okay, yeah. yes, that's fine. It's red because it was added. That's the okay. reason. It's because it was added since the last meeting. Yep. Yes. That's Fence right. will be installed and maintained around the proposed dumpster area. Um, regular hours of operation shall be Thursday through to Sunday from eight to one. And in your management plan, you have said that um, you only have Sundays on long weekends, right? Typically, yeah. it's Thursday it's, and Saturday. It's, it's about a ninety day a year operation, is what it is. Okay, uh, total occupancy for guests shall not exceed 587 occupants. Mr. O'Connor, you want to move that to smaller numbers? Is yeah, can we can we do separate, we'll leave that separate put that right? aside yeah. so we can that'll approve all the ones we agree to? Yep, that'll be separate. Uh, the applicant shall coordinate with the Amherst Fire Police Department to have emergency responder radio coverage. That's been your in uh, one of the the uh, responses that you gave to us. Um, once new and sound windows are soundproofing are installed, you're going to test your radios. It shall be, and then, then there's a standard you have to meet MSBC 916.4.1. Um, well, that'll be included in the, in the conditions. The employees of the spoke shall be responsible for controlling loud and or obnoxious behavior in and around the building. Um, you, we talked about uh, no cups outside and litter free. So. The, I think this is a good place to put the condition here that your employees shall pick shall um, um, prohibit taking um, glasses out of the out of the building. Uh, Mr. Watt, what shall I, did, did we already deal with that? Yeah. So no. actually, in a further condition, it's uh, discussed about the exterior of the building. But um, you just mentioned interior of the building, Steve. Unless I'm hearing you incorrectly. No. I, I no. probably made a mistake. <laughs> That's okay. no, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, yes. I think it's a reasonable condition that that the patrons shall not be allowed to exit the building with uh, any containers um, of liquid. Um, yep. uh, that, that's that's really what you're talking about. It's what the applicant said that he does. So let's put it in the Brilliant. condition. Yep. So I should we a policy for for you guys for all businesses in the future of this realm that that should be in place? Yeah. It's standard practice yeah. for us and for our yeah. community. I think. Oh, absolutely. It makes Mr. Wachilla, where is that in our conditions? I don't see it. So we don't have that one in the conditions. But I was going to ask the board: Should we table condition 16 to modify the language to include that, or what do you want to do? Because I know, can just write it now or. Uh, condition 24, the applicant's management personnel shall be responsible for ensuring the exterior of the establishment is free of trash and litter by the close of the business on days in which the establishment is open. Yep. So that means you, and then we put it right, put that also as a next sentence that uh, the, the uh, management personnel shall um, prohibit use of taking um, vessels or containers outside and to pick up after the um, after closing, something to that effect. I would suggest beverages rather than containers. Just good. Yeah. Yeah. You. yeah. Okay. That's a good that's, that's a good rule anyway for the all right. Yep. Um so we've got we were talking about 16 laundry. We want to continue 16. 17 is a building permit shall be obtained by the applicant prior to any construction taking place. Of course, construction, interior construction shall be according to the plans. Um, no fewer than four bartenders on each ship, shift shall be tip certified. So all your bartenders, and there's no less than four on each shift shall be uh, tip certified. And then all on-site security personnel, no fewer than seven on each shift, Shall be crowd control certified. Um, 
you talked about nine in the management plan. Here we talk about seven. What's the number that we want to choose, Mr. O'Rourke? I'm fine with nine. Um, okay. We're going to employ that anyways. We have nine. Uh, we'll have nine doormen, seven, uh, eight bartenders, and two barbacks on every shift. Yeah. That won't change. Uh, All right. So we'll just put the nine there. That's because that's what's in the management plan. It works. Yeah, that's no Good. Problem. All right. Again, there's no objection to that change. All right. Minimum staffing levels of state of the management plan shall be kept during normal hours of operation. Staff shall park in the parking lot behind the existing spoke. It's in the management plan. Alcohol shall not be served after 1 a.m. Um, management. All right. We talked 24. We talked about beverages not going outside. 25. Staff shall be present at the exit doors and close the business and shall assist with the exiting of patrons. All right. 26. Double doors facing Prayer Street shall be kept closed but not locked during normal hours of operation. The establishment owner shall manage and shall return to the special permit granting authority. 12 months from the first day of operation to review the management plan's effectiveness and complaint history related to the expanded occupancy and to determine if any adjustments to the management plan is necessary. Mr. Chair? Ms. Marshall. Yep. I would suggest a, a window. I mean, just like return 12 to 14 months. Okay. I have no problem. But otherwise, it's like to the day of, yep. you know. Wait, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, I'll I'll let it go to uh, to the discussion on the on these the conditions. The, the so do you have an objection to twenty seven? Um, if you do, it's it's good to raise it here. Then we won't include it in the in the in block approval. Okay. So re say what twenty seven is again, because I didn't. Yep. Sure. 27 is the establishment owner shall or manager shall return to the special permit granting authority. That's oh, okay. No, I, I don't have yeah. a problem with that. No, I don't. Yeah. Condition permit pertaining to fire hydrant pending response. Okay. Yeah, um, that. that one is in the um, has to, uh, let's see, condition related to the fire hydrant. How do you want to state that, Rob? Um, it just has to be done per the instructions of the fire department placement of the new fire hydrant. Yes. So we could, we could state that um, the applicant shall work with the town engineer and the fire department to appropriately site and locate mm -hmm. the fire hydrant and uh, All right. to, to service one to 11 Prey street. And that could be good. All right. Mr. Chairman, I actually yeah. do have the, the, the issue that I had with the doors. Um, I, maybe it wasn't clarified when we, we were discussing with the applicant. Um, the, when, the, when the doors are open, um, is there, does the door stop that keeps the doors open in the case of, a, of an emergency, is that door stop have to be manually operated from the interior side of the door, or is there a way to automatically? Is there some way that 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 door can door stop can be automatically just um, uh, set forth so that um, somebody doesn't have to reach down and grab it manually? or try to reach it with their foot when numerous patrons are trying to exit the building. Um, is it, are we talking about a, literally a manual door stop? Because that's... I, I think you're seeking clarification on a point. So Mr. O'Rourke, is it a manual door stop or is it an automatic door stop? Well, it's a manual door stop. I don't know how an automatic door stop would function because that means every time the door would open, it would lock in place. That would uh -huh. be the purpose of, of the exit. Is there a way that the that the the individual who's stationed at the door could could operate the door? Is there a yeah, door they that flip it down? They would open it and flip the flip the uh, the okay. manual lockdown. That's what they do at the end of every night when they're dispersing the crowds that are in, inside of it. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'm just concerned that in an emergency that might be a difficult operation to to execute. 
So I, right. but you're not expecting to 26 to the, the door condition at this point. So, um, no, I, I guess the other question I have is uh, there are double doors. Yep. Is there going to be, um, so, at, so. at the end of the day, or do they have one person for each door or, um, or the doors, um, or is there going to be a management person at each door because they are double doors with no central approach? Okay. Okay, what all we're talking so let's let's circle twenty six. We'll come back to it. I just want to go okay. through the ones that we all all approve on. We'll come back to twenty six. Okay, uh, and we'll circle that. Uh, we've got twenty eight the fire hydrant language that you and you've got that for us. The special permit granted to the spokes Pleasant Street. The ownership of the business was granted to the special permit to operate the building. Were to change, then the special permit will expire immediately after such change of ownership. That's that's a little different than some of the other um, change of ownership wording. I think it's the same thing, but um, Ms. go ahead, Ms. Marshall. Well, I'm just curious, this is my inexperience, is this standard? Did the permit, <laughs> I mean, you can't just sell the business and continue, that will continue to operate according to the permit? Well, one of the things that we tend to do when we, and mm -hmm. we do it with other, even with um, some rental housing, that the management plan has to be approved. They come back for the with housing, they come back with the management or parking plan or some other kinds of things that we then approve. Uh, and they, if they don't meet um, the criteria that we determine, then the, they don't have a management plan and they can't operate. So that's the, the hook to make sure that there's, um, the new owner is going to be consistent with the man, with the previous management plan. In this case, we have a business where they may change the, it may change the business significantly. And I think you need to have the ability, the, the need to come back to the board with a new, the new owner. Oh, we're going to run this thing the same way. Oh, we're going to change it significantly. Whatever they, whatever the plan for the, the new owner is. So that's the reason for this. I think that's the reason for this uh, condition. It is. <clears throat> It's not unusual in the, what we've done in the past. And, you know, the someone would love, to, would love to sell it on, with no conditions at all, I'm sure. But um, it exists on my current building, too. So uh, yeah, that's yeah. Kind of it's pretty much standard, okay. and especially for licensed businesses. Ms. Marshall, it's something that you do a lot. OK, thank you. Okay. Yep. So um, there's 29 and there's additional conditions. So those are the ones that I think are without objection. Um, see the ones that should discuss deliveries all right those are all potential discussions so to summarize the conditions for this would be condition uh the one we would not have is seven and because that's the that's the um volume indoors 14 and 26, I think are the, and 14 and 26 are not um, unanimous. And so we'll deal with those separately. Also 16 though, weren't, doesn't something need to, somewhere need to be specified that patrons cannot leave with beverages? Uh, we amended 25 to do that. Oh, we did? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah 25, we put the beverage um, limitation, no beverages outside on 25. Mr. Chairman. Yep. Um, so I have condition nine circle because I think we're unsure about the number of days that was sufficient for, um, I believe it's oh. for the sound testing. So did the board uh, want to continue that one in, in discussion after this vote or what was your thought there? I think people were happy with, I thought people were happy with 30 days. 30 days, okay. Yep. Alrighty. Okay, so I would move I would, I would accept a motion or entertain a motion that all those um, conditions that we have uh, discussed, except for 7, 14, and 26, be approved. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? 
Second. Moved and seconded. Is there further discussion on that motion? Mr. Sloviter. Hey, you just, I've just been looking through my papers. Can you tell me, can you clarify what the three um, points are that you said are not included? I want to sure. make sure what we're, yep. the three yep. that are not included in what we're about to vote on. Yep. So there's seven, which deals, condition seven, proposed condition seven, which deals with a, um, um, the volume at the boundary of the property. Which is the con which is driven by the volume of the the music inside the property, and Mr. O'Connor wants to move to amend uh, to limit the volume inside the property. So seven, okay, seven is, deals with that. Number fourteen is the total occupancy of guests. There was a question about whether uh, reducing that, and number twenty six is the double doors, the three double doors on opening up to the sidewalk. So okay, those thank three you. conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then, of course, on the next page, we haven't gotten to the other possible conditions. Um, we'll get to those later. So, but the ones that I think we can make the um, get the consensus on those are the, those. Uh, but for those three, we have a motion before us to approve a motion and seconded before us to approve those conditions. If there's no further discussion or clarification, we'll take a roll call vote on that. Chair votes aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. And Mr. O'Connor? Aye. The vote is unanimous. The motion passes. Now let's deal with um, the three, three, vo uh, three motions. I also, so I want to deal with those three motions. I want to deal with the uh, um, queuing of patrons outside the establishment. Uh, we, I think we've already dealt with that, Rob. I don't think we need to go through that again because we've got, we've reduced the number from 385 to 3, 300. And we've discussed in the management plan how there are not people sitting in front of those double doors. They're not standing there. So I think we've dealt with on page 21, condition one, I think has been satisfactorily addressed already in the management plan and other places. So you Do don't you want to make that a um, condition then, Mr. Chairman? Well, I think we've we've talked about it, and it's mm -hmm. in the it's in the management plan already. Yep. And, mm -hmm. and you're not going to have your management plan does not have people in front of those doors. Is that correct, Mr. O'Rourke? That's correct. Yes. Okay. okay. So then I think we don't. I, I think it's a good <clears throat> a good thing to do, but I don't think we need to do it in the conditions because it's in the management plan. Okay, and the management plan's already addressed in condition one anyway. So okay, okay. Yep. Um, condition on deliveries. That's not something we've discussed. Um, the management plan calls for deliveries to be done at this place on Thursdays and fr uh, Fridays and Thursdays and Fridays or Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, Thursdays and Fridays. Is Thursdays and Fridays during the day when you're not in business. Is Correct. there is there some concern about the, uh, the the delivery time? And there's a reason. Is there a reason to restrict those deliveries to something other than the Thursdays and Fridays as as um, stated in the management plan? No. Yeah, I don't know why we need it. Why do we yeah. need this condition? I don't. I don't know. I'm not. I don't. Rob, do, have you given it some thought? Yeah. So the reason why I put it in there is because, um, in terms of parking the delivery vehicles. So Rob Moore and I discussed keeping that in there in case the board wanted to entertain the idea of limiting how far back towards the rear of the building that delivery vehicles can go to. I mean, the trash enclosure is at the rear of the sites. So obviously, the guard vehicles are going to have to go back there anyways. But we're yeah. talking about the bigger vehicles that might deliver the kegs, um, the supplies, et cetera. But if the board doesn't really see any need to discuss it, then that's also acceptable. So that's just – it was something to give you to think about in case you want to make an informed decision. Right. I, I, I kind of think if the deliveries are a problem, the, the – the, um, owner occupant or the, the manager has to figure out how to get, get get his product into this building and he's got to figure out how to negotiate with his suppliers to do that and I don't need to tell you how to how to do that unless your your answer is to inconvenience your neighbors and uh, we haven't seen that yet so and if it is we'll be, you'll be back in a year and we'll hear about it okay 
or 12 to 14 months, and we'll hear about it, I'm sure. Okay, the last one, so we don't do two, and the last one is um, raise curb on the sidewalk. Um, so I like, I'd like to entertain that notion as we discuss um, conditions. I think if we can, personally, I think that the curb cut with uh, bollards or with um, cones in front of the curb cut so that it's an obvious sign to a car that they can't go any further and they can't run up the, the, um, the sidewalk. And that sidewalk is seven inches, about seven inches above the street level. So there's already, it's 14 or 15, I went out and measured it. It's 14 or 15 inches above the street level, the curb cut, if you take it down seven, you still have a, a barrier for the car, but, and you have a less steep uh, step for a, a patron to get out. But you put some bollards or some cones there to indicate that there's, that there's a, a, the, the curb cut is there. I think you've solved some of the problems. If I can make a quick comment on that, um, something to consider is we don't, I don't know if there's a code that enforces this and that, that can be discussion with Rob, but the curb cut that creates the egress off of that curbing would certainly not have to be wider than a car. So in theory, we could make it an egress width of, and, I, and I'm in agreement of, the, of, the, of cutting this part out. I don't think that's an issue whatsoever. Um, it could certainly be at a dimension that doesn't allow a standard vehicle to be able to go above it anyways, you know, so mm -hmm. we can make mm -hmm. it 36 inches or whatever, whatever that may be uh, for a code requirement. But of course, at that level, wouldn't allow a standard vehicle to to pass. Okay. That's actually sort of solve both problems, I think, in, in that one. And in, this, and in the effort to get this done and not have another, not come back and make the decision tonight on the number of inches, let's say that we, let's amend this condition to say that we remove the curb cut, but not to an extent, not to a degree long, uh, wider than, than a car as per the um, um, approval of the building commissioner. So something to that effect just said, this is less than, uh, less than the width of an average car as approved by the building commissioner. Deal? So does that work for everybody else? Uh, Mr. Maxfield. Um, what's the, the length of that door? Uh, exit because some idea is that that cut would be 72 inches is it yeah. clear space. is that the uh if, if we want to make it uh to to just kind of keep in line with that thinking so we're not coming back to it uh could we make the determination of the building commissioner that if it is does exceed um the average size of a car that a, a bollard could be put in the middle if not we could skip the bollard leave that up to the building commissioner to determine we could do all those things i mean we could do that I, I'm thinking that with the um, discussion that we've had about this, a pretty substantial discussion we've had about this, and with Chris and with Rob, can talk to the building commissioner, work something through that will provide that a car can't get in there because of the limit, and leave it up to him to try to make that make the final determination. I think the applicant is in the uh, is inclined to agree with this, and so I don't think we're having to impose something. But he wants to work this through, so I, this is a, might be a time when we can really give it to Mr. Mora to make a decision and save us trying to micromanage this one. I think. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't mean to interrupt Ms. Marshall who has her hand up, but uh, okay. would you want to write the condition to be reliant on the determination of the building commissioner for an appropriate style, or what? What is the board I, discussing? I, what we're discussing is mm -hmm. well, I, I'll. I'll let Ms. Marshall talk and then I can, um, she has her hand up, I'll let her speak and then I can uh, perhaps, well, that, perhaps she has an answer. <laughs> no, no, well, no, just somebody mentioned, you know, then putting bollards in front. We don't want to take away one obstacle and put in more yeah. obstacles. So they it's just something, again, could be those white concrete blocks you see them all over the place and at the end, at the head of a parking space, just to, prevent, you know, just like chocks for the wheels that they're not going to go any farther. Um, so, you know, let, let's just let's just do this that we have a, a opening that is not wider than the average car, because that's what our goal is, as per the uh, determination by the business building commissioner, and just leave it at that. He, we all know what we're we all know what we're wanting to achieve by this. And, and I think that um, a couple of people sitting with some pencils can figure it out pretty quickly. 
And I'm not afraid of, of giving that to the building commission to make that determination. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, just, um, I, I think that, I think that the seven foot rise from the, the, uh, the public's uh, uh, way in which the cars are parked um, is a sufficient barrier to any vehicle um, entering, you know, jumping the curb. Um, and it's, uh, and I think the, the real issue is, again, restricting the width of the space so that it, it doesn't constrain people from exiting the building, but also does not encourage the use of that space by vehicles. Yeah. Uh, usually what happens is the, as they do with uh, um, HP spaces, they simply cross half the space and then no one parks there. Um, and I think that that's probably the, the solution the building commissioner will come up with, but, and that's the simple, straightforward, easily recognizable solution. All right, so I'm, I'm sensing a consensus around general direction to the building commissioner and letting him make this. I'm seeing people nod their heads and so I'm gonna assume that that's okay. Um, and then you, I had a note here that the uh, hearing protection for staff upon request, but that's in your management plan, so we do not have to we do not have to impose that as a condition. Um, I do have. All right. So the one that I would add to our end block approved conditions, condition. Um, three here on the second page, on the page 21, uh, we'll remember it, of course, but condition three, which will be, as we've discussed, to give discretion to the building commissioner to um, approve a plan to have uh, a curb cut, for lack of a better term, uh, up to his, just up to his satisfaction that it's not wider than the car. All right. Um, so is there any objection to that? Are there any other conditions that are, uh, people want to propose? Ms. Marshall. I don't want to propose any, well, certainly no new conditions, but I wonder if it's worth uh, including in this new, this number three, the curb cut business, yep. why, why it is we're doing this. This is to facilitate rapid exit from the building. It can't hurt. <laughs> it, 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 it makes sense to do that. Back, well, why, why on earth do, are we getting yep. part of the curb? So. Yep, that makes sense. And it gives direction to the building commissioner. Okay. So unless there is any objection, I would entertain a motion to approve that condition. Do I have so a motion? Moved. And is there a second? All right, the second. Any discussion? If there's no discussion, the motion is on approving the condition as amended um, several times <laughs> to allow the building commissioner to um, approve a, cur a cut in that uh, seven inch curb uh, in order to facilitate um, exit by patrons um, from the building. No further talk, There's, it's a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. S Ms., uh, Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Ms. Mr. O'Connor? Aye. All right. Motion carries unanimous. Now we have three conditions that um, there's some controversy about, and I think we should proceed to each one of those. The first deals is the first condition deals with the sound at the boundary of the lot line, but that's going to be conditioned by um, to some extent by the any limitation on the sound inside the uh, establishment itself. And Mr. O'Connor, you want to limit the, the sound inside the uh, establishment itself. So that's why number seven, uh, we can't agree upon yet. So Mr. O'Connor, what would you like to, to um, propose for limitation on the sound inside the establishment? Inside the establishment for recorded um, sound uh, only. 
Not okay. for live sound. Right. For recorded sound only. My view is that's something that can be controlled by management. Um, that the um, the level at which uh, hearing damage appears to begin is at 85 decibels. That will um, that of course can't limit all the other sound that could take place in the establishment, but at least for the recorded sound that that is in the hands of the management um, that the that uh, that level be uh, 85 decibels not apply to live music at all. So to restate your condition, it would be a new condition that says um, recorded music shall be limited to recorded music shall be limited to 85 decibels inside the establishment in effect, right? Right. Okay. All right. And we have the proposed condition. Who wants to speak to it? Mr. Slobiter, I saw your hand up. Yes, actually, for the very first time, I disagree in a slight way with our chair, who said that the sound at the edge of the property is determined by the sound inside. I don't know that that is actually true. It certainly would be affected by the sound inside. <laughs> However, the sound uh, mitigation steps that the that Mr. O'Rourke is proposing, the windows, everything to control the sound inside. I think if we set a decibel limit at the curb, for instance, or anywhere outside the building of 50, I don't remember, I heard 50 decibels, I, had, I heard 70 decibels, I don't, doesn't matter to me. If we set a limit outside the building, I don't care what's going on inside because if the sound outside exceeds the limit that we impose, then the operator of the spoke has to do something to, re to reduce the sound. If that means turning down recorded music or telling the band to lower their amps or whatever, I don't, it, it will be his responsibility not to violate the limit that we have set outside the club. So I am opposed to any mention of sound inside the club because Quite honestly, it feels to me like overstepping our authority and flirting with micromanaging as long as the club does not violate the sound on the sidewalk where it would affect the general public. I don't see any reason to complicate anything by imposing an interior sound limit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pulver. Other comments? Mr. Maxfield. Yeah, I, I also um, can't say that I would support any restriction of the um, the sound levels inside the building. Um, the one thing, though, if, as long as we're talking about this condition, I uh, is for noise on the outside. Something I don't want the uh, applicant to be in violation of this condition in the event of. When there's going to be a line out the door, I'm sure doors are going to be open and to do all the, the sound reduction you want when you have an open door, there will be uh, noise trespass that will likely exceed this of that condition. And my concern here is in the event that with, with, with this type of condition that we might we might run into an issue where now the, the applicant is violating the, the special permit by keeping the doors open for, for easy access for, for patrons. And I, I don't want that to be something that comes up later where if, if residents, uh, that, that becomes an issue. That, that actually is one of my concerns here because at the end of the day, I think that's gonna happen. And, and like I said, I, I think it comes with the territory of, of living in and being in the downtown. And it's not a concern that I have but my now concern kind of goes the other way. Like I don't want to see the applicant um, in violation of this condition for that reason. 
So I, I don't know if, if board members have thoughts about that. Hmm. Well, I, 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 you know what, Dylan, I hadn't thought about it from that respect. Um, I, I had thought that limitation, because I, I think that's a, almost a reasonableness test, is that when the door is open, it's loud, when the door is closed, that's when your sound mitigation um, mechanisms take effect. Um, and they're, they're, when it's open, it's, it's, you have less mitigation because the door is open, but it's not going to be open all the time. And I would think that the testing, and I don't know this, so, but I'm thinking the testing is done when the mitigation is in effect and not when the door is opening and closing. Um, I think that's the case, but I don't know that that's the case. But uh, Mr. Wachilla, do you know? I was gonna say, usually they would do it when the mitigation's in place. So if the door is temporarily open, um, and there's also a condition in here where I believe where we specifically state that doors have to be closed at all times anyways, but not locked. So that already kind of requires that he keeps the doors closed anyways. And if the person is using a sound test, so say if an inspect inspectional services guy is using the sound test from outside, they're gonna wait for the doors to be closed anyways, because the problem is the sound traveling with the mitigation in place anyways. And if the doors are open, technically, it may not even be open for that long to begin with. So one would assume that it would be with the doors closed. It would be with the sound protection mitigation factors installed by SPL systems, um, et cetera. And I do think there's a reasonable expectation on the parts of neighbors that it not be too loud. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the goal from the applicant is to be at 60, but this is 70 here, which gives them a little bit of leeway. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I understand what you're saying, Dylan, is you don't want him to be caught on a technicality five years down the road when somebody is upset. And I, I get that. Um, I get that concern. But I think that at the same time, you've got people that um, are going to test this, pass the test with, the, with I think, the um, and we'll have it back in 30 days. To, we can ask them if there's a um, how they did the, met, the the testing. You know, within 30 days, uh, we'll know. And if and if Rob comes back and they do the testing and, the, and business or building services says that it's you know it was um, it didn't pass because the door was open, we we'll, we should know about that. So, you know, I'm not so concerned about the 70 number. I'm more concerned about limiting the business plan of the applicant within the building itself. Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, I think the, this discussion, I think, um, in, would encourage me to, to, to say that the, the outdoor noise test should be um, undertaken with the doors closed. I think we ought to make it specific. We shouldn't have to have somebody come back to us and say, well, the door was open or whatever, no. I, I think that we ought to make it very clear in, the, in any exterior noise condition that the, that the test be conducted um, with the doors closed. Um, and that would, we don't need to have all this back and forth. Mm -hmm. We ought to just specify what we intend, what we understand should happen and, um, and eliminate that that area of concern. It's a fine suggestion, as far as I'm concerned, uh, Miss Marshall. Oh, uh, can I? I think Chris had her hand up. I just wanted to. Go ahead. Maybe she has some additional information, Miss Brestrup. Yeah, I just wanted to point out to you that the accessory uses section of the zoning bylaw already limits the amount of noise that can, can be produced by live or recorded entertainment to 70 decibels at the property line. So that's already in the zoning bylaw. So there's, um, you know, you could not even have this condition here, but if you want to have it, that's fine. But I, I think it should match what is in the zoning bylaw rather than deviating from it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Marshall. Yes, um, I'm not in favor of limiting the sound inside. Um, I agree with Mr. Slobiter. Um, again, these people are there by choice. I don't go to any concert, 
without <laughs> even a restaurant without <laughs> earplugs with me because I know it gets things get loud. People can they vote with their feet. Um, I think it's I think it's patronizing of us to decide um, on the behalf of ad, uh, other adults what they can tolerate. Um, Unless, is, so, I mean, Miss, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, again, second, Mr. Con, Mr. I just want to give everybody a chance and we'll get back to you. So we've got Ms. Marshall, we've got Mr. Maxfield, Mr. Sloviter, and my feeling, my feeling as well is that I, I think that the suggestion of putting in doors open seven day testing is fine. I'm not in favor of limiting the indoor decibel levels to uh, to 85. I think that's that's we're looking at it all. I think that's a it is a it's a business decision. This is a dance club, and that's the people know that when they go in. That's what's that's that's the noise that they expect to go and and, and endure. As far as I'm concerned, not enjoy, but endure. But um, I'm almost 70, I'm no longer 21. So it's not what, it wouldn't be my choice, but I would let them do it. Look, Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, I, again, this is not directed at the patrons. Right. Um, this is not, and, and neither was the, the uh, indoor smoking prohibition. This is directed at the employees who, um, who I think are, uh, this is a workplace safety issue for the employees has nothing to do with the patrons. Um, and it was not pat it was not patronizing to the employees of establishments that were uh, ordered to prohibit smoking. Um, and it is not patronizing to the employees of this establishment to limit noise to a level that will not damage their hearing. Um, and uh, I, I don't think I can make it clearer than that. Thank you. All right, um, Mr. Sloviter, then Ms. Marshall, then I think we should move on and dispose. Okay, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make this very quick. It involves an odd confession. I actually have an app on my iPhone that measures decibel levels, which I installed at the Mullen Center at hockey games because I couldn't stand how loud it was. And at the Mullen Center, the highest volume that this thing read was 106 decibels, which was mind numbing and was reached over 100 a lot because the announcer likes to scream. So I have been listening to this with my sound meter on. I'm listening at a volume that is comfortable to sit here. And it is generally in the mid to up to upper 60s. It has exceeded 70, not much, but it's never been down to 50. So 70 is actually a fairly comfortable number. And decibels um, are not progressive, they're geometric. So it, sort of like earthquake mm -hmm. uh, intensity. So uh, I'm listening, actually, as I'm speaking to you, it's registering 80. So it's obviously it's louder when I'm talking to the to the phone. 70 at if 70 is the town current established limit at the property line, that is not invasive or intrusive to anybody, in my opinion. So I'm just giving you actually a number. And if my phone is defective, it's not my fault. So there you are. All right, Ms. Marshall. You should get your money back if it's, if it's wrong. Um, um, well, then I would say as for the employees, I do believe they are covered by OSHA. Yeah. And OSHA has a general, has a noise standard for general industry. So I don't see why we think we have more information or better expertise than that agency. All right. I think, so I think the, the, mo the question before the body is, do we want to amend condition seven, which is the condition that talks about 70 decibels at the boundary property with additional restrictions on the amount of, of the level of sound inside the establishment. 
So the, the question is, do you want to amend seven by adding a new restriction, a new condition, a, to, a new restriction on condition seven by adding a restriction of 85 decibels in the establishment? For recorded? For so recorded music, absolutely. Yes, you're yeah. correct. You're absolutely correct. For recorded music. Um, that's the motion before the body. That I, I'm assuming that you'll make that amend, um, move that amendment. I would, I would make so move. All right. So the question is, do you have a second? And I don't think you do, but maybe somebody wants to give you a vote. But right now, I don't think there's a second here for your, your, for your amendment, Mr. O'Connor. Okay. Okay. So we, then we have, um, so that is not moved. So we're back down to number, number seven. Mr. Chair. Amended before us, unamended, of 70. We Again, this is one we did not approve in block. So number seven is before us, unamended, except for with doors closed, even though there's a town um, uh, uh, limit on it already. There's a town bylaw on this. The proposal was to put, put in here with doors closed. Number one, does, does people still want to have that condition with doors closed, that amendment with doors closed, or do you want to move on and just leave it as it is? Mr. Maxfield, you were the one that brought this up. What's your, I'll, I'll, what's your desire? I'll do the same. I'll make a motion. If, if people support it, we'll do it. If not, we'll move on. Uh, so <laughs> I, right. I, I make such a motion. Such a motion to add the words with doors closed after 70 decibels. Uh, is, there a second? is there a second to that? Second. Mr. O'Connor O'Connor seconds that. The motion is before us. So the motion is to amend number seven by saying sound produced by the proposed live or pre-recorded music industry shall not generally exceed 70 decibels with doors closed. And we'll fix that up so it sounds a little bit better English, but with doors closed of the establishment, which doors, uh, but any, as measured at any property of the bound, any boundary of the property on which the establishment is located as determined by regulations adopted pursuant to section 5.0422. That's the motion. To fix. And it's for an amendment to, to condition seven. Um, any discussion on that? If not, we come to a vote. Uh, all uh, chair votes aye. Um, Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. O'Connor? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. All right, so now we have seven as amended by that motion before us. Do I have a motion to um, approve condition seven? So moved. Is there a second? I thought that's what I just did, but sure. No, no, we just, we just, <laughs> voted, we just voted on, we just voted on the amendment to that one. And now we have to vote on it as amended, <laughs> right? We voted on it as amended. All right, all those in favor of condition seven as amended by the with doors closed <laughs> amendment, say, uh, we'll vote on it. I say aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. O'Connor. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. Condition seven as amended is approved. So now we go to condition 14, the total occupancy of guests and employees combined shall not exceed 587 occupants as specified in plan, shape, plan sheet A-1.1, first floor plan. Mr. O'Connor, you wanted to lower that number to something. Do you have a yeah. number to give us? Yeah, and I, I'll just say what I did is I, I um, when I first thought about this issue and saw the occupancy level and the calculation that was done to determine it, um, where each person would be would be uh, occupying five square feet. I cut out a piece of cardboard uh, two and a half by two feet, which is five square feet, and found that I think it would be very difficult to um, to imagine. Uh, that many people on that limiting themselves to that small an area. Uh, <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm of the mind, 
I have been thinking of a lower number, but my view is that um, I would feel much more comfortable with a number of 400 rather than the proposed number. Um, I think that there's all sorts of uh, problems that occur when, when you have 500 and some odd people confined to uh, a space uh, uh, two, two by two and a half square feet per person. And I think uh, this, there needs to be uh, fewer people, uh, fewer patrons. Obviously the, the applicant has a well thought out plan for how to staff the, the facility, but I think uh, the proposal for the for the number of patrons is is too large. The space allocated to patrons is too small, given that people are going to be circulating with drinks in their hand and so forth. I think 400 would be a more reasonable number. Again, um, if this if this were not a special permit issue, then we'd go by the you know whatever. But this is a special permit issue. My view is that that space that I that I tried to imagine 500 and some odd patrons in in confining themselves to two by two and a half square feet is is not. I don't think that's a, a good situation, and and that that would be my number. It's considerably up from what I initially thought. But I think it's reasonable to reduce the number of patrons occupying that space. So your motion then to clarify, your motion is to, to strike out 587 and insert in lieu thereof 400. Yes. Okay, got it. Um, is there a second to that motion? There's not a second to that motion. Okay. All right. So we have before us number 14. Is there any further amendments? Are there any other amendments to number four proposed to number 14? If not, we will vote on 14 as unamended. All right. The vote occurs on condition 14. Do I have a motion? I have a motion. Do I have a motion? What Mr. Maxfield moves? So moved. Is there a second? Okay. Mr. S Mr. Mr. I think you <laughs> you won that one. You hand it got up first. <laughs> would I'll you would you read the mo read the I motion? Yep, I will absolutely. So that we have a motion and a second to approve the condition. The total <laughs> occupancy parens of guests and employees combined and parens shall not exceed five eighty seven occupants. 587 occupants as specified in plan sheet A-1.1, the first floor plan. That's the existing condition unamended. Any discussion? Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, I, I, another, another issue about this, I think that that number is, is um, uncountable by if the police were to make a determination that they wanted to make sure that the occupancy was what it was supposed to be, counting 500 and some odd is not reasonable. Um, you'd need the whole police force to do that. Um, no, 400 is a little more reasonable. Um, it's above what I thought, but... Um, but it's that, sensory, it's sensory, sensory. Uh, there's an electronic uh, thing that they, they use so that People are measured when they are counted when they come in and then discounted when they leave. So there is some ability to do that, whether it's 400 or 500. Um, but the question before us uh, is further discussion on the on the unamended condition. If not, the vote occurs on the on condition 14. Roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Mr. O'Connor? No. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Slaughter? Aye. All right. The motion carries uh, five, I mean, four to one.
The next condition is the double doors facing prayer, Pray Street shall be kept closed, but not locked during normal hours of operation. This was the one where you, Mr. O'Connor, wanted to, to uh, discuss whether they're manual or automatic um, door stops. Um, yeah, and I, my understanding is, I just want to be sure that when, when those doors are open, um, there's going to be a person for each door because these are double doors, and if you have manual stops, then you're going to have to have a person for each each door, each um, and. As long as the applicant can say that that's the case, I'll be happy with it. But um, but in an emergency situation, are there going to be two individuals at each of the exit doors um, so that each of the doors can be stopped and, and kept from closing on the patrons who are trying to exit? Um. You know, I, I guess the question occurs. Uh, the question is to Mr. O'Rourke: You have three. You have a person at each door. You have three rovers, and you have people out, and you have one person outside. So you've got three plus three, ro two rovers plus one person outside, and then you have two, and you have the, then you have a um, um, a lead a, a, a manager. That's, so you have you have sufficient personnel to have two doors, two people at the at those three doors. We do, and my personal opinion is that it's unreasonable. Uh, a person can operate those two doors. We have a, a staff member at an egress uh, that doesn't constitute two doors; it constitutes one 72-inch double door, um, and they are perfectly sufficient to be able to open those doors and operate that manual um, um, door stop on each door. To open that in the case of an emergency. I don't see the need uh, for two people uh, per door is basically what Mr. O'Connor is asking for. I, I think that's unreasonable, uh, but my opinion, uh, I would say no, uh, but that's up to the board. Yeah, so, all right. so Mr. Mr. Chair, I, yes, I'm Mr. not Chair. asking that two people be stationed at each door. I'm just asking that the, that the management plan in terms of an emergency provide for the for each door to be opened and secured in the open position by by an employee um i i I'm, I, think I, I think that i don't think the applicant misunderstood what i was trying to say if there are double doors the doors swing one swings left the other swings right it's going to be a little difficult in an emergency if, if people are trying to pour out the door for uh, for the operator, for one person to to lock the, you know, to essentially put in place to make sure the doors don't close, uh, both doors. So I, as long as the applicant can say that he's that that the the other individuals can get there and do that, that's fine with me. All right. So I, I think I think we have the management plan is to is to staff those doors sufficiently. So I'm inclined to vote on this um, on this condition um, as contained in the uh, proposed application report, unamended, and leaving it there. So I have a motion to do that to approve condition 26. I, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood what you just said. So you don't. I, we have a motion motion to approve condition 26 without amendment. And not modify the management. You just we right. don't need anything, is what you're right. saying. Okay. Management plan, yeah. We don't the management plan is contains this stuff. So condition 26. Is there a motion to approve conditions 26? So moved. Is there a second? All right. I have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? If not, the vote occurs on condition 26. Okay. The chair votes aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. O'Connor? I'll abstain on this one. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. The vote is four <laughs> ayes and one abstention. 
Motion passes. So, are there any other conditions that the board would like to consider or propose? I'll make a motion, and if I don't get a second, um, I'll we can we can go go on. Okay. Can I make them a? I'll make yes. a motion. It's the place to do it. That, that the um, that there be a requirement that the um, air handling capacity of the for the building. Um, or the part of the building that houses the patrons um, be uh, conform to post COVID improvements in the in the code. So. All right, I, 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 we don't have a motion. We have a motion. It, does somebody want to second that motion before we discuss it? Or do you want a clarification of his point? It seems to me what you said is you want post COVID um, requirements in place for the air handling. And I don't know, what, so the, whatever's in place now would be post COVID requirements no. in place. Yeah. The 2015, 2015 things are not post COVID. So, but, well, but they're, they're, but now, but they're the ones that are in place. No, and it may be that, yeah. but that's what I believe before mm -hmm. it opens, there should be post COVID. Um, and, and I think the, the inspectors and the code enforcement people in the town are very aware of the discussions mm -hmm. that have gone on around this and, and they will be. They'll be informed as to, uh, they'll make an informed decision. But I think uh, using the, simply saying, oh, the 2015 code is in place and, um, and therefore we should use that, I think is, um, is ignoring <laughs> the immediate three years past. That's clarification on this point. Is there a second? Mr. O'Connor, I don't think you've got a set. That's okay. All That's right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. We move on. And Any I have questions? one final motion. And if yes. I don't get a second, then we, you know, at least it's disposed of. Right. Okay. All right. Um, I, be I believe that in accordance with um, section 10.384. Adequate and appropriate facilities will would be provided for the proper operation of the proposed use. Um, the applicant has said that he has a lease for 20 years. It certainly appears as though the improvements that are being made are long range, long term improvements, upgrades, and so forth, L designed to last. Quite frankly, the 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 life of the lease. And um, I think it's just impossible to ignore the fact that 20 years from now, um, all buildings should have, should be providing some measure of, of uh, electrical um, augmentation, not just taking in stuff from outside, but generating stuff on site. My personal view is that the proper place for solar panels is on the roofs of buildings, commercial and, re and residential buildings and commercial parking lots. Um, and I don't think it's in this day and age, I think uh, to approve the building that's going to be in use at this level for 20 years without providing some requirement for the minimal so solar um, installation, I think, is uh, abandonment of our duties. And so I would so move that to be required to submit to the town inspectors a plan to install uh, solar panels on the roof of the building um, uh, to uh, 
not to meet the requirements of the building, but to to generate as much electricity as can be done with the building uh, at present. Um, is there a second for Mr. O'Connor's motion? I don't see a second for the motion. Uh, the okay. Motion for lack uh, of thank second. you, Mr. Chairman, for the courtesy of being able to make the motion. Absolutely. No, that's why you're a member, Mr. O'Connor. Yep. Yes, Mr. Uh, Rob. I just want to make a quick clarifying point that, you know, when we come up with these conditions that we instill in these applications, you have to keep in mind that it has to be for a provable uh, benefit to the public overall resulting from this project. And you have to think if we're instilling a condition, how easily could it get challenged in court? Because the applicant could go to court for a condition that seems unreasonable. And if it's something that is unreasonable, it doesn't have any public benefit to it, it we could lose. So just keep that in mind for future meetings. <laughs> Mr. It's, Chair? Uh, yes. Can I just say something um, yeah. just about um, Mr. O'Connor's motion? I, I, um, I, apl I, applaud, I applaud the effort to pursue yeah. solar, but this exact issue has come up in my church where we want to, some people want to put solar panels on the roof. Um, it turns out it is not structurally capable of doing that. And the cost of doing it is, um, is not small. And I, since the applicant is not the owner of the building, I'm not sure <laughs> that we could require the applicant to do this. I'm not sure the landlord would even permit it. No, and again, it might not be structurally possible. So, so I think it's a great idea. And in separate from the concerns that Mr. Wachella raised, um, it's, it, it, it's just not necessarily doable without a lot of investigation. But I, I think all, I, I don't, I can't speak for all of us, but I can speak for myself that I'd like to see more and more of it when, when it's practical and doable. I agree no. with Mr. O'Connor. I'm a proponent for electric for solar panels too, but I don't know that it would work in this particular building at the no. moment. You could do a quick, you could get a couple of good companies right in the neighborhood to give you a feasibility study in, in pretty quick time. They would, as long as you might give them little credits, solar panels by XYZ company, they, <laughs> they would probably be happy to have a very visible project um, in downtown Amherst. Bespoke solar, not spoke live, spoke solar. There you go. <laughs> All right, you might get it cheap. All right, and if there are no other conditions, we have to make our our findings under um, several sections of the bylaw. So we're moving on from conditions, I think we've gone through each one. We've approved those conditions, most of them in block and others um, individually. We don't have to make a finding under Article Seven for for parking because um, they're located in the um, the. the parking overlay district and they don't need to, there's no parking requirements. For the sign regulations, I don't think we need to make a finding for the sign regulations because um, it shall not exceed 10% of the area. Um, and you clearly your sign does not exceed 10% of the, the space. I don't think we have to make any findings under 5.04, five, um, 5 do we? Ms. Brushbrook, we don't have to make any findings under Section 5, do we? I don't think so. Excuse me, I don't believe so, but um, you also have a condition that reflects um, Condition 5 or Article 5. Sorry. Article 5, yeah. 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 Yes, we do. Yeah. So then we, have, we come to Article 10.38, Article 10 findings. So I'm going to run through these, um, and I'd like to use the same procedure. I'm going to run through each of these, assuming that they're approved. If not, raise your objection, and we will separate that, that finding from the rest of them. First, uh, section 10.380 and 10.381, the proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is a proposed and or the total town as deemed appropriate by the special, grant, special permit granting authority 
the proposal is compatible with existing uses and other uses permitted by right in the same district. Um, it's there's similar businesses across the street and in this area. So I think that we're clearly um, confined at 10.380 and 10.381 are met. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 generally deal with nuisance for the neighborhood and, and abutting properties. Um, I won't read it all, but this prop, the proposal says would not, the proposal would not constitute a nuisance due to air, water, pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. The proposal would not be substantial inconvenience or hazard to abutters, vehicles, or pedestrians. And it goes on and talks about other um, uh, visually or other kinds of offensive uses or uh, products coming from the use. Um, I think that, that it, it isn't, um, it doesn't produce a nuisance. I think that the uh, noise limitations that the, that the applicant has proposed along with the um, lighting rec restrictions, the ambient lighting restrictions uh, that he's um, has put in place. Um, and I think uh, speak to the um, way in which he has mitigated the effect on neighboring properties. And so I think 10.382, 10 383, 385, and 387 can be, uh, are met. Ms. Brushfoot, you've got oh, your hand. Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't put my hand down from last time. Okay, <laughs> I, and I didn't look up, so I didn't see it till now. All right, 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities would be provided for the proper operation and of the proposed use. Um, so he's, this, in this case, this oftentimes deals with outline, the um, ability to, to get product in and out of, of uh, commercial presence, commercial properties. Um, the applicant is modifying the interior to include a bar, um, areas for staff, site management plans, um, and also two sheds in the rear, which will provide for additional storage, as well as ways for trucks to get in uh, and deliver product to the, to the establishment. So I think 10.384 can be met. No. 10.3. Oh. I, I disagree, but. All right. Do you want to take that out? Um, yeah, because I'm. Yeah. All right. 10.384, we'll remove and we'll come back to it. 10.386, the proposal ensures that it is in conformance with the parking and sign regulations. Um, it, it is. I don't think there's a question about that. 10.387. Um, it was also spoken to in earlier, but um, this deals with pedestrian movement within their site in relation to adjacent streets, properties or property. The special granting authority deems likely to have an adverse impact. We could order a um, um, some traffic review, I think is what this was about. Yeah, impact on traffic patterns. I, you know, I, I don't think we need to do that. Um, nor do I, need, do I think we need to have a traffic impact study we spent considerable time talking about the impact of this project on, on the, um, on traffic, and we've also looked at all the, the different ways in which public transit and um, ride on, um, called up traffic, uh, uh, ride shares, can uh, meet the needs for um, um, motor vehicle drivers. Miss Marshall, I'm not sure we've closed the loop on queuing on that sidewalk. Um. Okay. So. So the queuing on the sidewalk. Whether so, it can can take up the whole width of the sidewalk. I know it's not in front of the private, doors. Okay. Private um, space. We were told it's a private sidewalk, but we could still, um, you know, and ensure that there's the uh, the people can walk by. I I'm just saying I don't think we've resolved it. I don't. Know well, we have. On the, so that's. I, we have to resolve it if we're going to proceed. So we have to make a decision. So the, it's my understanding that the you three, they're going to limit it to 300 people in the standing on the on the sidewalk waiting to get in. That's only going to that's and that does not take up the whole width of the sidewalk. Is that the notion, Mr. O'Rourke? We have. We're gonna. I'm seeking clarification on this, so I'm, I'm not trying to engage in a, an argument about it. Yeah. The, right now, we have 300 people that are going to be on that sidewalk. That sidewalk is how many square feet, and is that one way to look at that? Is how many square feet is it, and how many people can you put on one half of that sidewalk? 
can you fit 300 people there? Or um, are you going to have people outside that are going to try to keep that sidewalk open? Are you going to have people who are monitoring the outside going to keep that sidewalk open for other people who may, the public who may wish to use it? I guess that's your question. Is it not? Mr. Yeah, the discussion that was had before was that that's a private sidewalk. The direct other side of the street is a public way and that the architects who designed it argument was that it doesn't need to be designed to be cut in half for people to access in both directions that it's not designed that way and with it being a private way you know with the exception of you guys making a, a ruling on it doesn't obligate us to have to do that so okay. we're going to get to the board of that I understand, now i understand your argument okay i didn't before Ms. marshall is that consistent um, and mr mccannell i'll get to you in just a second yep I mean is it acceptable i understand acceptable, I, th yeah. I think if um it is the case that that the spoke will ensure that the public sidewalk is is um open to two-way traffic the whole length then then i'm then i'm fine with this yeah we wouldn't utilize any of the public way um on the other side there i appreciate sure no but i mean for your other business oh yes 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 yeah we we operate that way currently would continue to do so we'd be in violation i think if if we did it so okay you have you have parking you have stanchions up or you have um fencing is like fencing or whatever they are stanchions, yeah. fencing that you put up to across the street of the existing spoke right yes those are stanchions okay. correct portable stanchions, stanchions yeah. and they're removed we do not leave them I, I you know in case any other topic of this comes up they're not left there uh is the Overnight. second that we close our premises they are removed and put behind the building so sure. all right mr o'connor i yeah so i think it would be not a good idea to try to mix the general public with the, yep. the individuals who, who are trying to enter the establishment um i, I really think that the fact that there is a public sidewalk across the street is is adequate for this street and i I'm, i don't think i don't see an issue here all yeah, right I'm, I'm fine we can all right not, so we'll, okay. i understand we'll keep, this in, we'll keep this in the end block uh findings yeah. 10.388 the proposal ensures adequate space for off street loading and unloading of vehicles uh, deliveries are done thursdays and fridays not during business times, and um, there's a you've provided for space for doing that. 10.389 adequate methods for disposal or storage of sewage, refuge, recyclables, and other wastes resulting. Uh, you're on, you've got a waste dumpster and a recycling dumpster, and you're connected to the town sewer. So you've got uh, sufficient um, waste and recycling uh, capacity. 10.390 the proposal ensures protection from flood hazards. I don't think that's applicable 10.391 um, unique or important protect unique or important natural historic or scenic features i don't think that is uh, applicable to this ap uh, application the proposal provides adequate lines landscaping i mean you haven't increased the landscaping but you're you're proposing no additional landscaping but you're not proposing anything less so it doesn't change the existing conditions uh, as much as we may want it to be more beautiful it, it's not a change from the current situation, so it's not a detriment to the uh, neighborhood. 10.393, the proposal provides protection for adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting. Um, you're only, you, you aren't adding additional um, broadcast lights. You have the existing lights, you have some lights that are broadcast lights that are there now, but those, you're not adding additional and you, may, you are, um, having some ambient lighting and some downcast lighting that uh, on the sidewalk. Yep, and we always take into consideration downward lighting. I've been in this town for 22 years. Okay. I understand it. The proposal of voice that sent feasible maximum impact on slopes, floodplains not applicable. 10.395 does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use scale and architecture. Uh, generally, this is you're within the, you look like the other kinds of buildings in the, in the area. You're not changing anything, so it's it's not an app. It's it's not an. Um, you, you're not. Um, it's really isn't applicable. All that, and you're and you're dealing with and you're complying with the design review board recommendations. Uh, Ten point three nine six proposal provides screening for storage areas. You put a four foot fence around the rear area of the dumpsters. 
Um, so you screen the, the dumpsters in the back, 10.397. Recreational facilities is not applicable, 10.398. Proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaw and the goals of the master plan. The proposal abides by the standards set forth with the zoning bylaws and the master plan to bring, in general, with the goal is to bring more business and uh, concentrate business in the downtown area. Um, and that this does that. So with the, Mr. O'Connor. Yeah, just the, the, the final 10.398 is the, is the section under which I would um vote not to approve given the noise inferior noise levels and uh so forth but um and so i think that that i'm i have a couple of sections that i don't agree that I, and i we've already resolved that there's no interest in my in my concerns in that area so I think that um, I think that you should simply take a vote on the conditions that you've articulated. Um, um, in all likelihood, I will vote no. I haven't heard anyone who who is who anybody else is going to vote no, but I've, I've made my position clear, and I think we you can proceed to a final vote. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. That'll save us all some time. Uh, we appreciate that. So the motion before us then is to improve, make the findings, including the findings of 10.398 and the earlier findings, 10.384 that we set aside for separate votes, including them in all the conditions, all the, uh, the findings from 10.38. Um, do I have a motion to make the findings that we can make findings required under 10.38 and 389. So moved. Mr. Maxfield, first hand up. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Marshall, second hand up. I've got a second. The, is there any discussion? Um, Mr. O'Connor has expressed his, his position. Um, I'm, I'm gonna vote for the, the motion. Uh, is there any other discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the um, findings in 10.38. It's a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Uh, Mr. O'Connor. Uh, no. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Sloboder. Oh, Mr. Sloboder, there you go. Yeah, here Mr. I am. I, I vote aye. All right. The vote is uh, four ayes and one nay. Um, the motion carries. Now we have a, the last vote is on the application granting special application with conditions, um, that, which is before us. So we've, we've approved the conditions, we've made our findings, then the final action would be to approve the special permit. That is special permit, uh, let me get this right. <laughs> Where is it? Uh, three face uh, uh, ZBA what? ZBA 2023 14 to be approved with conditions. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All right, we got a move in a second. Um, is there any discussion? This requires four votes. The motion before the body is, a, is to approve the application with conditions. The chair votes aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. O'Connor? No. The vote, vote, the vote is four to one. Four votes required to pass this and approve it. The motion passes. Mr. O'Rourke, congratulations. You've got your uh, spoke live. I also want to thank all the members of the zoning of the ZBA for their work on this project. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground over the last uh, two meetings, and I appreciate all of your hard work. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'll, I'll submit a, a statement as to the reasons I voted, I voted no. But, I'll submit it to the staff so it can be included in the report of the uh, of the, of the zoning board. 
That's fine, Mr. Panos. That's good. All right. Uh, next order. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all six hours that we spent on this. For everybody, thank you very much for your help. Yep. Mr. Goodbye. Judge, do you want to yeah. take a vote on closing the public hearing? Oh, I guess. We, yes. Yes, I didn't make the full motion. So the motion, I should also have moved to close the public hearing on this application. Do I have a motion to do that? Close the public Don't hearing. Move. Mr. Slobiter moves. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Maxfield seconds. Any discussion? If not, the motion occurs to close the public hearing on ZBA FY 2023-14. Um, Chair votes aye. Mr. O'Connor? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Motion carries five to nothing. The hearing on this application is closed. Thank you, Ms. Brushbuff. I failed to include that in my closing motion. Um, next order of business is um, public comments on anything not before the board tonight. So if anybody has, uh, any member of the public wishes to make a comment, um, they can do so by raising the hand or by pushing nine on their phone. And I see no raised uh, hands or no phones. So there's no public comment. Um, the other order of business is any business not anticipated within 48 hours. And this is normally where we talk a little bit about the schedule for the upcoming a uh, couple of meetings. And so we have a meeting coming up on the, what's the date? It's on the, the 20th, is it the 25th? We have our next meeting. Mr. Yep. Restaurant. That's correct. Yes, that's right. What do we have, Rob or, or Chris? What do we have coming up on the 25th? So on the 25th, we have 515 Sunderland Road, which is a uh, okay. battery and storage uh, system proposed. Um, it's going to be a total capacity, I believe, around nine megawatts. Um, it's going to be, this is actually a continued hearing from a previous meeting, uh, which I believe was April 27th. Yep. Um, so basically, the board has already done two site visits for this permit, and um, that's the only thing we have for the 25th. Um, then we also have two potential applications for June 8th. And then anything after that, I have not had any updates recently. Okay, and are those individual residences, or are these some of the, um, these aren't the 40 Bs, are they, the June 8ths? Nope, so the June 8ths, uh, one's for a, a continuation of a special permit from two years ago for a flag lot, and the other one is for uh, 485 Pine Street, which the um, proposed, Chris, is it a duplex they're trying to put in there, or is it a converted dwelling? Trying to remember what it was. Anyway, we have all yeah, right, so we have permits coming. Let's just say that. <laughs> all right. So we've got the twenty fifth or five fifteen. All right. Yep. Good enough. Any questions from members of the board? Oh, Mr. Maxfield. Uh, what what street is that flag lot on? Is it the one I'm thinking it is? Southeast Street. Got it. Okay. Yep. It's gonna be a quick one. Let's just say that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, if there's no other business, there's no other questions. I want to thank the staff again for the hard work. I want to thank all you guys, all the members of the, the ZBA for their hard work on this project. Um, Mr. Maxfield, how many more of these are you going to be with us? For how many more will uh, you be with us? I, I've got. I've got three left, so long as none of the three are going to be something that looks like it's going to continue beyond June. So if uh, a 40B <laughs> comes on our, uh, what would be our third meeting, then uh, and I would be be stepping out for it. But yeah, it looks like the, the next three are what I've I've put in for uh, to, to not be working. All right. I appreciate that. Thank and, you. Uh, I, I, before before that, I just want to say for this meeting, Mr. Chair, thank you uh, so much for that. I think you did a did a great job, Chairman, and I. It was uh, did this, this whole application. So, thank you. Uh, you handle it. You handle it well, and I'm always impressed. <laughs> you can only do it with good good board members. Make it easy. 
All right, man. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and Dylan, we'll be looking forward to the last three working with you. Thanks very much. Looking forward to it. All right. All. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night.